7 o'clock, and I will call to order this Monday, November 20th meeting of the Waterbury Select Board. First order on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Um, I would just add conservation commission to our appointments after the disaster preparedness committee because we have an applicant. Okay. Anything else? All right. All right. Um, we're first voting on the uh, amendment to the uh, the agenda. Uh, everyone in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> we have the uh, addition to the agenda, the, and it's already been moved and seconded. Uh, so this is voting with the addition uh, that we just passed. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved as amended. Uh, and the consent agenda are the just the minutes from the last minute. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Moving second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved as well as the consent agenda. Now is the public session uh, for the meeting. Anything not on the warrant agenda uh, can be brought to our attention. I ask that you try to keep your comments to three minutes uh, if possible. And we're glad to put this on the agenda the following meeting. Any further discussion? Any comments? Mike. I just want to uh, say I didn't have, I just got back into town recent, recently, but I want to acknowledge the passing of both of Waterbury as well as Vermont legend, um, Ken Squire, who uh, in the motor racing, he's a NASCAR Hall of Fame broadcaster. In Vermont, his family's owned WDEV for over 90 years. Uh, DEV is an institution in this community. Uh, I know I can't mention the times on Saturday mornings when I would listen to music to go to the dump by, how I would chuckle a little bit. And Ken will be sorely missed. He did a lot of things for the state. He was an ardent supporter of the Vermont Symphony Orchestra, which people will be surprised to hear with his motor racing background and also Vermont adult basic education. There have been a lot of tributes in the Times Argus and a lot of the media. But uh, I want to thank uh, Ken and the Squire family for all the service they have done for the uh, town, of, uh, town of Waterbury. Thanks. Yep. Yep, thank you. Now, one of the other things that was uh, noted was uh, how what <coughs> dynamic uh, role WDEV played during uh, Tropical Storm My Rain. 30 years, 30, 30 hours on the air. Yep, yep, that was, was impressive. Uh, Kenley will be missed. Other comments? All right. Let's uh, move on to the appointments. First one is uh, appointment to the li of the library commissioner. We have a candidate, Anna Black. Is Anna here? I don't see Anna here. All right. Well, we have Anna's application here in our packet. Um, and uh, she is expressed her interest in joining uh, the library. I believe we have the library director here. Any comments? Uh, no, we're happy to Here's welcome you. Oh, here we go. Yeah. All right. Good timing. Oh, perfect. We're just uh, entertaining your candidacy for the library commission. Yes, I am pumped. <laughs> Would you mind just uh, sure. coming forward and uh, letting us know why you're so pumped? Yes. Hello, Anna Black. I was here a couple of weeks ago about the Conservation Commission. <laughs> 
Um, and I had mentioned then, I was like, if it, anyone, anything opens up on the Library Commission, and then that happens. So <laughs> I was pretty excited about it. Um, basically, I love reading and love libraries, and we live right across the street, so it's convenient. Yeah, I mean, all right. <laughs> Question from the board. Now I feel like you manifested this moment because I remember you, uh, you know, saying that and, you know, been on your application, so I'm excited for someone enthusiastic to, yeah, to have this opportunity. While we're here, mm -hmm. are you also still interested in the Conservation Commission? I don't know how I many am committees you've I am on the Conservation been... Commission now. Oh, you're already yes. appointed. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, could Karen just speak quickly to what this appointment is for? It was just useful for me to have the background of what what we're acting on today with this appointment and what the status will be come town meeting. Sure. So, Anna, if you choose to appoint her, would be appointed until March, at which point she would have to run for election. Um, there will be two seats available on the ballot in March. One will be a one-year unexpired seat, and the second one will be a two-year unexpired seat. Um, and, and Michelle Baker would, would be subject to that same, those same terms. Should be a regular IBFC too. They're unexpired. Oh, In March? there may also be another full one. Yeah, I think she's um, I have some notes about that. Well, somebody will have to run for it, whether they, you know, they sign up or not. Okay, it's, it's IBFC. Yeah, you could be right there. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify what we're acting on today is until right. town So this is an appointment um, until uh, the first Tuesday in March? Uh, Deanna King. Deanna King, you're right. Deanna King's term will be expired. Will be up in March as well. Yeah, that was okay. right. So we have three candidates. In March. All right. So you're still interested? You know, yeah, the appointment will only last until the first Tuesday in March? Yeah, that's a good trial period. <laughs> Um, and an opportunity to potentially make some stickers. <laughs> Good. Um, if there's no more discussion, do I have a motion? Move to appoint Anna Black in the open position of the Library Commission for Radio Town Meeting Day. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda is the appointment to the housing task force. And we have uh, Mary Ellen M. Ramson. She's on Zoom. On Zoom. On Zoom. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> there you are. Uh, would you like to just give us a couple of uh, moments as, as to why you're interested in joining the task force? So I just saw that you, know, you were looking for somebody and that part of what they were looking for was someone who's a landlord and or short-term rental owner. Um, my husband and I have both. We just recently, about a year ago, built a new three or a triplex down on South Main Street. Um, building affordable housing is not easy. And I, I know that for a fact, but I also know that we do need more housing. Um, but I just feel that with... The knowledge I have as far as being a landlord, having the short-term rentals, um, we have both commercial rentals and regular um, residential rentals that I would be a good fit for the committee as far as that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Great. Question from the board. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, it does seem like it's a good fit, uh, and uh, if there's no more discussion, do I have a motion? I make a motion, motion to approve M. Lampson for the Housing Task Force. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations, M. Thank, uh, Thank you. When's the next meeting? Did we cancel this under? Uh, no, I got moved to Zoom 21st. So, yes, Thank December you. 21st. Sometime in December? Mm -hmm. yeah. 21st. Third Thursday, okay. so it's the 21st um, on Zoom at 6 p.m. For you and anyone else okay. who would like to join. Okay. I'm assuming I'll get a link somewhere before then, but that's fine. I'll touch base. All right. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Congratulations, Em. Thank you. Um, uh, next on the agenda, we don't have a second appointment for the task force, do we? No. Mm -hmm. no. 
Okay. Um, next appointment is to the uh, Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee. Candidate is Matt Duggan. Uh, is Matt here? Matt, ah, would you mind coming forward? Welcome. Thank you. Uh, if you wouldn't just, uh, if you wouldn't mind just telling us why you're interested in joining the task force. Uh, not to sound too much like the teacher I used to be at UVM, but um, <laughs> I tried to explain it all in the cover letter. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot. Does anybody have, anyone have questions about that? Because I'm not coming at it from a disaster preparedness perspective. I'm coming at it from a social science perspective. Um, and I've kind of tried to lay that out so that, you know, you'd see that I'm kind of thinking about upstream and how to bring people together and build more community so that we can um, address some of the problems that I saw when I was volunteering this past summer and mucking out and such. Um, I'm not sure how to do that, but I do know how to do research. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I asked the question. Um, I'm really curious, and what did I leave out? Well, I mean, I think it's in line, just from my own perspective, with what uh, the, the committee is about. It's, a, it's about organizing volunteers so that we are prepared uh, to set forth uh, better than we have been. Um, but there are others that have been more directly involved and may have more questions. Why uh, I know it's a yeah. day. When you, you come qualified, I will say I was struck interviewing all of them by just yeah. like going back to several minutes, the folks we have in the community who are willing to step up. So I would say it's don't mistake the lack of questions as a lack of engagement or appreciation for our candidates for our committees. But sure. You have a very extensive background. Yeah, and don't it don't, don't, don't uh, mistake my lack of wonder. I mean, I know I could talk all day long. Right? <laughs> if you, when you're in academia, that's what you do, and you and then you bore everyone. Pay for it, then, but we're not paying for it. But thank you for saying but it's, it's it's really important that you could you would be great to communicate the message for um, preparedness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Any further discussion? Do I have a motion? I move to appoint uh, Matt Duggan. Dugan? It's Dugan. Thanks for asking. Yes. Yeah. Matt Dugan. It's really a toss up. The uh, <laughs> National the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee. I'll second the motion. All right. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? No, my only reservation is the gender makeup of that committee, which has nothing to do with any of the applicants, but I am just going to say out loud. <laughs> I have mean, not done anything to address it myself. Okay, well, I don't think he's going to do much about that one. Yeah, I just felt like I had to say it. It's all men, yes. so that's so interesting. Because uh -huh. women are taking over the world, as I used to notice in the past, and I'm all for it. So, so that's so right. it's I think odd. a lot of the women who were originally, not to make it, but a lot of uh, folks who were originally helping out were gravitated towards the crew, the, yes. um, the committee that was formed like right after for other different positions. So I think like, some of the folks who might be interested are uh, overextended maybe at this point, but it's good to keep in mind. I went through today the list of uh, what I have for volunteer hours as part of the FEMA reimbursement for the people who assisted post flood and substantially uh, majority of the hours were done by women. Mm -hmm. hmm. We'll share different times, different seasons. And I just have to say, I'm fascinated by your video interface. I'm trying to trying to figure it out since I got here. How do we have? It's the Apple. Uh, so that's was my. And does that track voice? Yes, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. When it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't want to take up all your time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, okay, so what did you say with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll vote. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's <laughs> enough. Uh, any more discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations, Mr. Dugan. Thank you, <laughs> and thanks for all that you folks do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And okay, now round it out. Mm -hmm. All right. And next on the agenda is the appointment of, to the Conservation Commission. And this is a late appointment, so I don't know if they have the paperwork. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, here it is. Malachi Brennan. Did I catch the name correctly? Yes, no, yeah. Sure. 
All right, if you wouldn't mind just letting us know why you're interested in joining the Conservation Commission. Sure. Um, so I, um, you probably haven't had much of a chance to familiarize yourself with my materials, but I've studied um, trees and kind of forested communities for a lot of my life and also just kind of selfishly get a lot of relaxation um, and kind of moved to this town for outdoor recreation as mm -hmm. well. Um, but I spend a lot of my professional time now um, kind of focused on climate change issues and uh, environmental issues. I'd like to spend a little bit more of my uh, personal time and, and time in the community doing that as well, kind of getting to know the, the area a little better. Mm -hmm. All right. Questions from the board? Have you had the opportunity at all to um, uh, listen in or attend any of the conservation commission meetings at all? Uh, not live. Mm -hmm. I went back and looked through oh, well. some of their agendas and just kind of tried to get a sense for what they do. Mike, which law firm do you work for? It's um, it's called SRH Law. Uh, used to be known as Duncan Saunders. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it sounds like that's a lot of applicable things to what the Conservation Commission does. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I, I call myself an environmental lawyer. I think that's pretty accurate. That's what I spend most of my time doing. Thank you. Right. Well, once again, it does appear that we've got a good fit. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve, is it Malachi? Yep, that's right. Malachi Brennan uh, for appointment to the Conservation Commission. Did we discuss terms? Yeah, maybe I should just find out, but uh, for a term of what? Well, there's a open sea that ends in 2027 and open sea that ends in 2026. Do you have a preference? I guess I, I don't have a preference. Um, Going off this out here. Signing up for the long haul. <laughs> yeah. Want to go longer? <laughs> yes. Okay. That's 27? Right. So, so that, that change duly noted in my motion. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Malachi, welcome to the board. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Now, uh, I think we're done with the uh, appointments. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is the restorative justice. And uh, I'll just note that uh, we had uh, Lieutenant uh, Wynn in talk with us uh, a couple months ago. Um, and uh, when asked about concerns, uh, he mentioned uh, that uh, there were youth uh, that were up at all hours of the night uh, that uh, he was concerned about, uh, asked us to consider a loitering ordinance uh, and or uh, putting up cameras uh, in public areas which we have not acted on. Um, it is in our parking lot, but uh, we thought that there should be some further consideration of this. And, and part of that consideration was about what's happening with restorative justice uh, in terms of youth and public safety. Um, and so uh, we've been able to contact uh, the director of the Restorative Justice Center in Montpelier, as well as um, Jane Willard, uh, who's been serving on the uh, panel. Um, so if we could have uh, Carol Plant come forward and explain how the restorative justice is, is working. Um, and then also you can call on Jane and others as, as well, can, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. Before we continue, just for the record, I want to make a note, and I think it just came out wrong, but when mm -hmm. the lieutenant was here, he didn't suggest um, cameras and loiter harnesses. There were just p parts of tools that he offered as things that exist, could be done, that we could talk about. So I just want to, for you know, minutes or record, it wasn't what he was trying to tell the town to do. Um, they were just, as we just asked about options, there were things that he mentioned that could be a possibility or something to think about. Um, Good point. The, Thank you for the clarification. So uh, Carol Plan, I'm the director of the Justice Center in Montpelier, and we serve um, the whole western, sort of southern part of um, Washington County. And we have our own panel 
that serves Waterbury, so it's all volunteers from Waterbury. Jane is one of those. She's been on the longest, I think. Um, Ten years. <laughs> so in terms of whether it's going well, I would say yes. Um, so we get regular referrals from our partners, Vermont State Police, um, and you know that it's an opportunity, especially for youth, to identify what they understand the harm to be by what they did, the actions that they took, and this is all pre-charge, so it hasn't gone to the state's attorney's office. Sometimes the cases go to the state's attorney and the state's attorney might send it back to the trooper and say, why don't you try a restorative process? So it comes to us either way. And then really the panel implements this process where um, people are asked to address the harm, who's harmed, how are they harmed, what do you need to do to fix it, how is your community impacted, and what are you gonna do to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. So it keeps it really local, it's non-shaming, um, they end up with no criminal record if they complete the process, and the, you know, what's be, the other thing behind it is if they don't complete the process for whatever reason, then the trooper can still refer it to the state's attorney's office and say, yeah, we tried that RJ thing and it didn't work in this case. And then the state's attorney can make a decision about where it goes from there. Um, so, I don't, Jane, do you want to speak to some of the benefits that you notice about, with youth especially? <coughs> Certainly. I don't think that we have had a, um, a large number of youth in the program. And I think earlier on, uh, many of the referrals went to the diversion program. And so, and, and their uh, primary population was juveniles. But of late, we, we have, we've had some very serious cases. And um, the beauty of the program is that uh, the person, um, we don't say offender, we say responsible person and the person who has been harmed, we refer to as the affected person. So um, in the case of the juvenile who may have offended, and um, I can see the need maybe for an ordinance, um, uh, if, if the offense is not um, a charge or a, uh, what, whatever the term is, um, I have a little concern about that, but we've always hoped in the restorative justice process that we would get direct referrals from the troopers in the area. Basically because we can invite the trooper, um, the parent, guardian, um, the responsible person into the process. And so there is that opportunity to say what happened, why it may have happened, um, what the outcome could be, um, and we've often not, we, we read the affidavit if it's, um, if it's referred to us from the state's attorney's office, but actually it's really, really important for us to hear it from um, the person who maybe has been affected by noise or whatever it is, um, we have on occasion had troopers participate and it's been incredibly valuable um, and very meaningful. And certainly the juvenile and um, the parent guardian has information. So the process, I think, um, is the best chance for the community to be involved. Um, and um, I, I think for, there would be a less likelihood of reoffense. Um, people get to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. All of the people involved get to tell their stories. And then when an agreement is made, everyone has input, primarily the person who has created the harm. Um, my question would be, if it's an ordinance, and um, Carol has um, drafted ordinances for the city uh, of Montpelier. I haven't drafted them, but I have contributed oh, and okay. said it's okay to put restorative justice as an option in your ordinance. So yeah. I've done that, but I've not drafted them. So uh, I, again, I, I would not want to have to be the trooper who would have to determine what would happen in a non-compliant agreement. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, I'm sure the kids will all talk if there's been non-compliance and no uh, real um, consequence, perhaps. Um, there would be some administrative cost um, that Carol would uh, administer. Um, and again, if, if the fee is not attainable, there could be a sliding fee scale or the, the panel could determine um, how that would play out. But again, um, if we took on a lot of cases, and I have no idea because we've not had any of these referrals because um, it's not unlawful mischief, for example, it's an annoyance. Um, so it's, it's kind of a slippery slope. Um, but the panel's paying for it, and uh, yeah, I, yeah. There's just if if there isn't a motivation for the person to do it, then they it's voluntary, right? So um, they need there needs to be some kind of motivation. Typically, the motivation is I don't want to have to go to court, um, or I don't want to have to pay the fees or fines that are associated with this. So you know that's. That's the uh, consider what well, that's the consideration really. Um. The transformative piece, from my point of view, is um, having um, troopers have the opportunity for community policing and really connecting and relating, other than having to um, issue um, an ordinance, mm -hmm. for example. So ideally, I would think that um, at Troopers' Choice, that if the ordinance is passed that there would be some conversation in advance before it would be necessary to enforce it. Mm -hmm. um, questions? Um, a, a comment and a question. Uh, maybe I'm going to show my age, but back in the day when young people did something bad, they were sent to a farm and they had to do some work. and that a lot of times they didn't want to go back and do the hard work on the farm, and that took care of it a lot. But that's you know. You, just, yeah, I guess we view that as punitive, actually, it's punitive. Yeah. and not terribly effective. But, right. So but, I, it, but it back in those days, it worked pretty well. <laughs> so I'm just I, I just want to speak to what we refer to as community engagement rather than community service. So, oh. mm -hmm. from my perspective, having done this for a really long time community service is viewed as free labor, right? So that is also punitive. And when we talk about engagement or connecting, reconnecting with the community, this is an opportunity for a person to name what their community, what they think their community looks like, whether it's their family. We had a case last week where it really was this, this person's family that was so important to them and so re-engaging, reconnecting with the family is the most important part of that restorative agreement. And we really focus almost entirely on that, right, in the agreement. So however that person defines their community, you want them to, to um, develop a sense of belonging. And if the person feels a sense of belonging in their community, they're less likely to offend against where they feel you know, like they belong. So that's that's like the, the advantage, which is why having the local folks serve on the on the uh, restorative panels is important because Jane can say, oh yeah, I live on this street where you did this thing that, you know, was a real big problem for us. And so they're making a human connection and that, that works. Well, that kind of somewhat answered my question because to me, what you're suggesting, this is almost a formalized community service with a way to get some res results that works for the community as well as the individual. Not everyone is asked to put in hours, right, to do service hours. Not everybody does that. Like I just said but last right. week, this person we saw, she was asked to um, schedule regular check-ins with her family members, right, to sit down if they can't, uh, if they don't have time, they can't have a meal together, but to do, find some way to check in with family members. So it's not, it's, it's this idea of giving back is not really the point of it. The point is to have somebody feel like they have a support system. They're engaged and they have, they're building support around themselves. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that um, we've had many, many occasions when um, 
the um, responsible party says, I've been unbelievably disrespectful to the trooper, and I want to make amends. Mm -hmm. And I always hope that that message gets relayed because, again, I think that that's such an important part of um, being community. So I've seen that happen. One person, one guy, decided to bake brownies for the trooper he had been so nasty to. But I guess my question um, to you, um, Lieutenant Ben. Oh, no. Uh, I'm Trooper Rancourt. I'm standing in for Lieutenant. He's on leave. and. Trooper Murdoch was on a special teams activation all day long, so I'm a stand-in today. Mm -hmm. But I am the former night shift one for a trooper. Okay. Okay, I think we get to see your cases. <laughs> Very well. Yeah. So um, I guess my question is, um, uh, the the ordinance, uh, if there was an unlawful mischief, I can see where you could issue a citation. But if it's like a noise complaint that really isn't probable cause to issue the citation. How, how do you think? So with any ordinance, it has to have teeth. Right? Excuse me for interrupting. Would you mind coming forward? Because I'm we can't catch you on the microphone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so with any law ordinance that exists, it has to carry teeth, right? That's the first component of deterrence. Um, but that being said, what justice looks like and when what rectifying a situation looks like, there's no cookie cutter solution, right? We don't arrest our way out of crime. We don't cite our way, you know, we don't issue tickets to get our way out of uh, fixing people from speeding. You know, it's, there's, a, there's more than one approach to get it done. If there's an ordinance, there would have to be some type of consequence for the behavior. So if it was a uh, noise ordinance, um, maybe there's a fee associated with it. Um, loitering, I don't, in this state, we don't have necessarily have a loitering statute. Um, we do have a noise in the nighttime statute, which is a misdemeanor offense. And typically those are reserved for the most serious of noise violations. But certainly if we had a noise ordinance within the town, that would allow us to uh, address maybe less severe cases of noise disturbances and refer them to uh, restorative justice, so again, Community engagement leads to community involvement, leads to better results, right? If you feel like you belong, you're less likely to cause an issue in the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome, right? That's the, you get buy-in, then you usually get a better result. Yes, I agree. And have you been involved with referring uh, an individual to uh, the restorative justice? Yep, I think within my first year, we had uh, some juveniles that had uh, lit a porta potty on fire. And I, I made a direct uh, referral to restorative justice in that instance. Mm -hmm. You know, the criminal justice system is it's a long, <laughs> lengthy system, right? Yeah. I've been doing this for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Once you're in the criminal justice system, it takes a long time to get through and then out, yeah. or whatever your consequences are. But when it comes to, uh, well, it's a principle of uh, punishment when it comes to policing, that the most effective results <coughs> are those that are swift, certain, and severe. Severe is not always the best result, but if they're swift and certain, where we have kids, you did something wrong, mm -hmm. there's a consequence for that, well, let's teach you why it was wrong. Mm -hmm. well, let's get you to buy back into the community and have a better result. Like the harm you caused did this to this to the, the company that owns the port of bodies. Mm -hmm. you know, they cost the, this amount for them to replace it mm -hmm. for the choices that you made. And I'm using just one example. Yeah. Um, but if instead, you know, we push them through the entire criminal justice system, by the time that there's a consequence or a realization of wrongdoing, there's so much time that's elapsed, Do not, I, I doubt you get the better result from that. Mm -hmm. That's Special been your experience? Because they forget. They forget. They have I barely remember what I had for breakfast on this. Developed <laughs> brains, right? Yeah. I think with um, the direct referrals, um, they're much more expedient because they don't go through the court. And I, I believe your conversations with the state's attorney has been, could you just please take care of it? We're not, you know, our, our courts are clogged, et cetera, et cetera. And if there is um, compliance um, to the agreed upon agreement, uh, then there's, there's no, um, uh, you don't get a... A punitive punishment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I'm trying to think of the question. I would like to express my support for restorative justice. It is my belief that kids, when having violated their community's trust, are severely punished. They are definitely uh, more inclined to reoffend as adults, feeling like they've been pushed around by the system and forgetting what put them in the system in the first place. Um, the reference of being sent to the farm. We definitely used to do a lot of things we don't do anymore. Um, <laughs> How long did you have to stay, Mike? <laughs> I just spent my time on the farm. Did you go to the farm? That's what I was wondering. Um, I guess, I guess my, my, my biggest question, my biggest follow-up question, I guess, is for the board. Are, are we of the mind that and having having a meeting with restorative justice and having had police sit with us uh, now on two occasions or three now is it two or three multiple occasions um, are the are the the mischief that we are experiencing in Waterbury from youth enough to elicit a response where we need to start talking about referring people to the justice system at all, or is it just a nuisance? May I answer, or my opinion? <coughs> um, I think, I don't know about ordinances and getting really niche and specific, and maybe we do, and that's something I think to have really serious conversations about, but because the incidences were varied, they weren't always noise, they weren't always vandal, there was a lot of vandalism, um, there was severe violence, there was, um, really, there were hate symbols um, included, you know, included in that vandalism, and it is not just, I mean, being out late and playing loud music, which for some people feels very serious, so I don't want to take that away, but it was causing deep harm, both physical, mental, and emotional, um, and financial. So whether it's creating ordinances, I'm not sure, but I think it's having these conversations to say, like, Something is not well with some groups, and it's, I mean, it's not just kids, but that happened to be it. I was young people during that, those instances. Something isn't going well, and they need help from someone to move in a better direction and for the community as a whole to feel more connected and safer. And so I think the connections, having the conversations, having the troopers know that we support this type of avenue, are talking about how do we push more in the direction of RJ um, for when things like this come up. I think, I think it does necessitate the conversation um, from my, even just my personal experience, but then also from what I've heard you know, as a board member. So um, for me, it's really just talking about like how, how do we help involve more um, you know, restorative justice as we go forward and how do we help you know, support the troopers who are answering these calls and you know, let them know what our priorities are and hear from them what their experience is. Yeah, if I recollect uh, when we were talking with uh, Chuck Wynn, Lieutenant Wynn, um, he was saying he wasn't sure if he had a role without an ordinance. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. and right. and you know, we it's see. It's the for us to act. Hmm? Right. So it, cre it creates an avenue for us to engage with those, those types of quality of life issues that we can address directly. Otherwise, I mean, for me to just stop a group of young kids that are out just right. being kids, we're essentially walking down the path of a Fourth Amendment violation. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. They have the freedom to move just as anybody else. And that's my concern, mm -hmm. is that we ordinance our way into a Fourth Amendment violation. Um, Mike. What would be like a high level bar of offenses that this can carry? And the second question is, we keep on just referring to all of you. There are adults who, you know, you know, they might not get into trouble, but, you know, because of different circumstances, you know, losing jobs and whatnot, you know, they could be in a bad way. Are those I, this, I, I assume that type of candidate would be a good person yeah. for restorative justice as well. Oh yeah, we take people of all ages. So the it's not just youngest I've ever dealt with was nine, a nine-year-old. 
and we do a little bit different process when somebody's that young, but I've had 80 year olds, honestly, in the right. program. So what would be the higher that? level kind of things like when you deal with? I know you know marijuana is not because it's kind of legal now, but it's very legal. Yeah, it's very legal. Well, I don't think the kids is not. <coughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> Uh, for pre-charge cases, it's really a lot of, you know, the lower level types of offenses. The more serious well, quality of life kind of offenses stuff. are uh, typically not sent to us pre-charge, but it doesn't preclude those kinds of cases coming <coughs> to us. It depends on the circumstance. Actually, that's an unusual one, but we actually we have a program in, with Montpelier Police Department to address those types of violations. We have our first case going right now where these people, uh, this young woman was referred for excessive speed and rather than getting five points on her license, she has to take the Vermont Safe Driver Program class and then meet with the restorative justice panel to talk about what she learned through this six hour class. So we do take those, but that's not typical that we get traffic violations. But, you know, and DUIs. So we're, we've had a lot of DUIs, see DUIs so that goes back to public safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. not pre-charge. So we're, when you're yeah. talking about the pre-charge, it's different. So when we get the probation referrals, we we get lots of um, lots of more serious cases, including uh, we had a case. I think it was the Waterford panel that saw the death resulting case from a, someone was hit um, by a pedestrian hit by a car and. We saw that as a restorative process after that person served their sentence. So it's a range. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How is your program funded? Uh, we get funding directly from the Department of Corrections primarily. And so the, in your, your particular center covers uh, to the southern half of uh, Washington County, is that right? Okay. Yeah. And then you've got six members on your panel? I think so. so. I think, yeah. yeah. We have some new ones, and we were trying not to overwhelm the, yeah. um, the process, so we've been kind of taking turns. Mm -hmm. yeah, taking not turns more than four, three or four will show up as volunteers. Um, but I think there are six, five or six on the Waterbury panel right now. But the Waterbury panel also typically will serve uh, Waitsfield and Waitsfield and Warren cases as well. So, um, and we have we have three panels in Montpelier that meet one in Northfield and one in Waterbury. So, we have a lot going on in our center. But, mm -hmm. uh, we're always open to talking about taking referrals. <coughs> um, so, in your opinion, what would make it? What would help you get more referrals, make Waterbury a safer place? Well, um, I don't know how, I, I know, you know, the, the troopers here do refer to us, which is not typical around the state. Not every, I don't think every county is, well, we've got every a unique relationship state. here, right? Yeah. And we've got troopers specifically assigned to Waterbury, which, oh, is, okay. which is different in many other communities. Yeah. Where we're primary law enforcement for some communities, but we're not always present. Right. We're not always able to be present. Do you require referrals from the police? What's that? Do you require referrals to no. people from the police? No, we take direct referrals from select board members, uh, from hmm. schools. Um, I, like one of those <laughs> I was actually thinking about a recent dog. Yeah, no, we will take referrals oh, from yes. lots of different <laughs> places. So, yeah. Hmm. The thing about getting referrals from other sources, though, is that um, it depends on the situation and, again, what the motivation is. If there's a motivation, if there's going to be a consequence, then that person's going to have, you know, some More motivation, motivation to do a restorative process or, you know, it's an, it happens sometimes that people just are willing to, to say, oh, I own that and I want to do the right thing. But there needs to be some kind of motivation behind it. It would be totally voluntary if it were a referral from. It is, yeah. you know, we like to say it's voluntary, but there is a little bit of coercion behind it. If you're on probation and your PO is telling you, go do the restorative process, you're probably going to do it, right? 
because you don't want the consequence behind that. But we do tell them it's voluntary. So if you choose not to do it, just let us know and, and you can go the other route, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But we explain all of the reasons why they <coughs> might want to do it. I think we've struggled a little with um, finding meeting places. And we've dis discovered that Wesley United Methodist Church is one of the few sites that doesn't charge. Um, so um, we've been a little cold. The boiler's not in, or maybe it's just in. Um, so, and so occasionally we've used the library, but we do need to be in a place that um, offers some privacy as well. Uh, and I also think that we um, are going to need to expand um, our community connections, if indeed it's community service. We've primarily depended upon the Senior Center, um, the Wesley United Methodist Church, and the Food Shelf. So those are sort of more around the community service um, things, and it's not as much community connection, and that's why I'm thinking that um, the community might do well to, uh, you know, in regard to um, uh, having an offense within the town, mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of having conversations perhaps with Tom or Bill Woodruff. Um, Alex and uh, uh, Tuscany and uh, Bill Woodruff have helped in the past, um, and it's been a good connection. So, um, and in a very different kind of way. So, I think that we just need to expand all of that a bit. Especially if we have a lot more cases. Yeah, a lot of work is done in the Montpelier Cemetery <laughs> by people who want to, you know, are required to do some engagement. Hmm. We've got a lot of need for help in our cemetery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grass cutting. Yeah, as long as, especially if it's young people, as long as there's some supervision or if you trust people to go out, you give them a project, you know, whatever it is, and you trust them to go do it. And hmm. The other thing I just want to focus on, too, is that like Jane was saying, we really give the people that come in front of us agency in the process. So we talk about doing with instead of two or four. So the restorative agreement gets created. We ask the, the person who's responsible for the harm to make the suggestions about what they think they should do, which is um, which is really helpful because it it you know that kind of. Um, it's not educating them, it's them doing some self-discovery around mm -hmm. what they understand the harm to be and what they think is important, and that helps them build empathy and see themselves and their community in a different way. So it's, it's a lot like magic, and um, it is very transformative when people get together and they feel supported and they feel like the, you know, the people, the strangers, is because they're meeting with a group of strangers, and the strangers sitting there with them actually act like they care about them, and they do care about them, because they volunteer, people like Jane volunteer because they want their community to be a better place, right? Because they care about the people that live here. There's also a confidentiality piece um, that assures them that, uh, it, that the information shared um, stays in, in the panel. Um, the exception, of course, is when there needs to be, like, um, a, sh a sheet um, documenting hours, for example. Um, I don't think we ever require that the person say what the offense is, but they might say no. the program they're coming from. They don't even need to say that. They just can go to a place and say, I want to do some work for you, and can you sign this document for me? Uh, uh, I was going to ask, you kind of explained a little bit of it um, as the, and you had mentioned it before, with community services, uh, free labor. Um, have you found it to be more effective community service or a more community engaged service, we, like, we, rather than mowing lawns? Yeah, um, we, I never talk about it as being service. I always say it's community engagement, and then I encourage the panels to have the conversation around what helping a person define what their community is or what community they think they've impacted. Like I said last week, we met with this young woman and she, it was all about her family as her community right now. That's the place where she gets the most support. So that's where she's doing some engagement is with the community. So it's, it's really, you know, it's really up to 
that person and um, what's important to them. And you know, sometimes they struggle with figuring out what they should do. Um, so they'll get some suggestions, but it's really a conversation. One of the opening questions in the introductions is, um, tell us a little bit about yourselves and or yourself and what are you really good at? What do you really enjoy? And so we have that piece in our, our heads. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the, the place of community connection, what is it that you might be passionate about doing to help? Um, and it's fascinating, but at least they're invested in what they think that they would like to contribute. Sure. It's, that's the magic piece for me, is when we start the whole process. Right. And we really want to know about you. We want to know what you, what you love to do, what, what you're great at. Sure. Mike, did you ever work with um, the Youth Build program? No. Might be something that would be, I know I used to be a mentor in that program. It's kind of for troubled youth. Uh, it get, gets them, they have a program where they do a lot of building, kind of like Habitat for Humanity, and it gives them some skilled training, but again, gives them a lot. They work with a mentor and gives them some self and that might be a good kind of program where, you know, especially a, maybe a little bit more serious case might be a good So program. what we do is we, in each community, there are resources, and so what might end up on a restorative agreement is that somebody go to this place and investigate what happens at, at a, a place like that where they might want to be involved. Right. But we don't, um, we don't create those kinds of programs. We don't, you know, we will send them toward resources, but we don't actually do totally that work. Really if they wanted to start a restorative process over there, then they could contact me and I'd help them set that up. But yeah, we really, we, and this is why having the local people in the community being on the panels, they, they know what the resources are and where they might send somebody to you know, sort out where they uh, might want to do something for themselves. And with youth especially, they, their, a parent or guardian has to be involved, which is really important because sometimes the parents also need some guidance around, you know, how to best help their child. And so when they're in the process, things get revealed sometimes that can be helpful for the whole family. Thank you. Um, I do want to say, you know, my question was going to be, you know, how can we help support? And I think you named a couple of things, so I want to express, you know, you can always reach out if you are having trouble finding a space. Um, you know, we might have some connections or business owners or people that have space we can connect you with or, um, you know, things like that that you think we might be able to help with. We might not, but, you know, it's another avenue to be in touch with the community and, um, but if you do think of other ways, you know, that, that we can be supportive. Um, I think I, I'm so appreciative that, you know, you're serving the town and it's so great to hear that, you know, our troopers are a part of that as well. I think it's really, it's, it's such a huge service, so. And I agree that an ordinance would really be helpful for me. Mm -hmm. So, sir, so it's an avenue. Uh -huh. Anything in particular, uh, Officer Rancourt, uh, that you think would be helpful as part of that ordinance? I, without taking time and looking at something really in depth, I don't want to speak to something that I won't be knowledgeable in. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about next steps, um, if there's a sample ordinance uh, that you Experience the, with the, ordin been the ordinance, there's two ordinances in Montpelier that name restorative process, and it's the dog ordinance, and then there's um, a public drinking ordinance, and so the restorative process is named at a certain place within the dog ordinance. I don't know exactly where it is. I mean, we, we do those cases every once in a while, um, not a lot of them. Um, but those are the two places that I'm sure of. The public drinking one, um, not been successful so far because most of the folks who are getting those citations are um, unhoused and have no mailing address. 
and most of the time don't have a phone that works, so there's no way for us to be in touch with them. So as much as we'd like to help, it's, it's not been, that's not been a, a helpful process. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again for coming. We'll uh, continue to keep close eyes on this and see uh, how we can help you move forward. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have the Waterbury Street Park Coalition. So, if we have a presentation, can I already stand uh, by? Uh, yeah, work it out with the <laughs> Do we have any other? Do we have any other? Do we have any other? Can join on the Zoom and screen share? I can even email it to you really quick. Yeah. I, don't, I can't do that either. I don't have email on this. Can you join the Zoom? I wish you had told me before. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. While you're working on that, <laughs> wouldn't mind introducing ourselves. Oh, uh, yeah, Tammy's uh, on Zoom. Uh, I'm Mike Rossi. I'm part of the coalition. Because I'm going to get busy, I'll just introduce yeah. myself. Right? So, yeah, I'm Mike Rossi. I'm part of the coalition, Waterbury State Park Coalition. And here to present to you tonight what we're going to present. I know. My name is Belle McDougall. I live in Waterbury Center. I'm part of the <coughs> State Park Coalition. We've got two other people up there. And okay. Jake. All right. yeah. My name is Jake Blavel. I'm a Waterbury Center resident and part of the coalition as well. Okay. Great. And up on the screen. Mike, do you have, oh, is he after an agenda? Tammy? Right here. Right here. Hi. Um, Tammy Bass, I live up in Waterbury Center, and I too am on the Waterbury Skate Park Coalition. Okay. And who's your other member? We, we also have Jake Seymour with us, and Jake is the uh, professional uh, skate park consultant that the coalition has hired. All right. And I'd also like to welcome Tara. Tara is a new member of the coalition as well. And I see that she's on Zoom as well. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us. All right. Mike's getting connected. Uh, any of you want to lead off? With, uh, I, where I can. Going? Sure. Yeah. I can get started while Mike is doing the... Um, computer. So uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us. I was going to do the introductions, but those have already been uh, accomplished. Um, so Belle, Mike, Jake Blavelt, and I um, uh, are part of a nine-member uh, coalition, Waterbury Skate Park Coalition, to give you a little background. And um, Obviously, we're here this evening to speak to you in regard to the plans for building, uh, rebuilding the Hope Davy Skate Park. Um, this evening, the um, our goals for the meeting this evening are to provide an overview of the skate park development activities, um, the conceptual design plans and budget, the roadmap and schedule for design and construction, maintenance, fundraising, safety, and security. And um, we ask and would really appreciate it if you, if everyone would please hold their questions until the end uh, of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we hope to be answering most of your questions throughout the presentation. So if you could just hold them, that would be great. Um, and one other goal for this evening would be to get a conditional approval of plan for continuing this roadmap of activities that the coalition has been working towards. Um, how you doing, Mike? <laughs> yeah. 
I guess I can continue so we don't uh, lose time here. Uh, the next, we, we have a slide deck that Mike is, I, sounds like he's working to get that up there. So uh, I'm going to just speak in regard to the, um, the overview of the skate park development activities, give a little history uh, of what's been transpiring. Um, as most of you know, the Hope Davy Skate Park was deconstructed this past October. Um, we really, we being the coalition and a handful of volunteers came out on a Sunday and uh, it went very well with the help of the town as well with town trucks. We took the whole skate park apart. Um, we prioritized Hope Davy because of the safety, for safety reasons. It was, um, Getting old, that skate park has been there for 12 years, if you can believe it or not. And uh, we decided to, to put our focus into Hope Davy, uh, one for decommissioning and two for rebuilding a really well-loved and used skate spot. Um, as I said, 12 years, it's been going strong. And we just, um, really do not wish to leave a hole both in recreation and uh, or physically at Hope Davies without a skate park. So we're looking to rebuild uh, next spring, as soon as next spring to get a new uh, concrete skate park uh, in place of what was a wooden skate park. Um, wooden skate parks only live a certain amount of time 12 years was a pretty good run for the wooden one that was at Hope Davy, but it has come to an end. Um, so we're looking to increase the surface area of the actual uh, asphalt area that is currently there is 4,000 square feet. And we're looking to increase that area to 6,000 square feet. Um, uh, the uh, this would be to increase the size of the skate park by 2,000 square feet and to continue to allow for a basketball court to be there, um, which will continue to be 2,000 square feet. Uh, we, the coalition, has uh, met with the rec committee uh, along with the rec director, Katarina. We've met with them numerous times. Um, it's been a pleasure working with all of them. And uh, they have um, given us the backing for our goals for this expansion, um, along with town goals that we've been working in sync with um, in regard to the master plan, um, i.e. parking. Um, as I mentioned, the basketball uh, court is will remain. We feel that's very important. Uh, as, long, as, as well as an ADA path and um, horseshoes. All that goes on at Hope Davy. Um, and so uh, we feel that this is just in sync with the master plan and um, would hope to be able to just increase the square footage. It um, brings us out into the grass 40 to 50 feet, roughly. Um, so, uh we have um we've learned a lot in the last four years that the coalition has been together we've uh educated ourselves and and learned a lot about concrete skate parks um as you know we're working towards a larger skate park hopefully down the road but we have refocused on hope davy um, and But through all the four years of our learning and experience really has helped us put together uh, what we feel is, um, <laughs> no pun intended, concrete uh, um, process of going forward with this. Um, so moving on to the design and budget, I give you Mike. All right, so this is the conceptual design that Tammy referred to. So we had Jake Seymour, our contractor for the skate park design, put this together. 
uh, we worked with, as Tammy mentioned, the rec committee and the rec director, Katerina, to kind of simulate what was in the, the plan, the master plan, with the exception of, as the idea here is enlarging the play surface in this region. So here's the firehouse, mm -hmm. uh, just to orient everyone. And then basically, the way it used to be is the skate park was here, and then you had the basketball court right about here, 2,000 square foot playing surfaces, respectively. And so what we like to do is swap such that the basketball court now is closest to the firehouse, and we expand the parking or the um, skate park surface to about 4,000 square feet, uh, so it goes out into the grass. Um, but it will also accommodate the ADA path. We moved the bas there's a baseball storage area. I'm trying to get my cursor to work here. Uh, right around here. So I think there was talk. Uh, to move that behind the backstop here so that wouldn't be in, in the way. Uh, this parking surface is probably not going to happen the way it's rendered here because I don't think we want an impervious surface all the way out into the grass like that. So that's my bad for not telling um, Jake Seymour about that. I think this would be gravel if it did expand or engineered grass if, if there was an expansion of the uh, parking surface. But yeah, I think that's, that's probably all you need to say about that. That's a, a nice rendering. Again, it's consistent with the, the master plan with the exception of expanding the play surface there. The parking. The parking and the play surface that we, yeah. we are going out into the grass. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so on to budget here. So the, the, the table here, I won't go into the, each of the line items, but the, this is basically a construction budget for a skate park that Jake Seymour has put together for us. Um, about 132k worth of materials and labor uh, is all cooked into this. Uh, those costs per, per line item. Um, and then what we also have is a little buffer here for the design, the permitting, and site prep. And we're still working through what uh, my next slide talks about what that might look like. But that's about 40,000 extra dollars to get through those stages. Uh, so the total estimate is roughly 173. We have raised about 97 so far. Uh, 55 of that has just been recently pledged by a single donor, so that's great. Um, Blauvelt Banks, Jake Blauvelt here to my left. He's been running this great uh, skateboard event or s snowboarding event at Bolton. It raises roughly $15,000. It goes up every year, so maybe that number is going to increase. But that'll be nice. So the delta, when you add up what we expect to raise by about March, is about $61,000. So and, and, and Bella's going to touch talk a little bit more about the, the fundraising activities. And also, I just want to make you know part of these parks. What what a lot of the parks do is they reach out to the community and they look for in kind donations for either materials, lodging, uh, labor. Uh, I know my son's coming home from college next summer, and he, we're going to put him to work on this thing, possibly. So <laughs> I think, yeah, uh, just some community donations are always helpful when we, when we get into uh, financial aspects. So next is the roadmap and the schedule for the design and construction. And I'm working with, again, someone who's done this quite a bit, um, Jake Seymour. If, if you have any questions about maybe some of the sequencing and uh, you know some of the logistics around some of these steps, I think Jake will be able to answer them. But basically, the hope is to improve the conceptual, the conceptual design here uh, for, for one or more of those elements that we showed by December, uh, so next month. And then finalize the design and get an RFP out to skateboard construction uh, built, you know, contractors uh, by January. And then select that contractor by March, so two months to turn it around. Um, Permitting and compliance. Right now, my understanding is, you know, there's a stormwater permit that we have to talk to the town, uh, Bill Woodruff, about whether or not that's needed, depending on, you know, his his thoughts on the matter. And then the conditional use permit, the DRB a hearing. We we you know, we'll, we'll get before those folks, present our case again, um, and see how we do through that. That's we're on the we're on the schedule for December 6th, and then we finalize the budget by March 2024. Uh, do some site prep, May, June, 
and construct next summer, the middle of the summer, June, July. That is the goal. Um, yeah, I think one of the things I do want to bring to the forefront here is, you know, so, so it's not, you know, miscommunicated is when the RFP goes out, it'll be the RFP from the town because the town will own this asset. So we, we are also asking, you know, some coordination with the town to help, you know, basically put your letterhead on an RFP that we will write. But I imagine there's some contracting, bonding, you know, there's some, there's some other stuff that we need to make sure is in that RFP so it's done legitimately and the contractor is legitimate, you know, that we select. Uh, is capable and all that so all right so moving on to maintenance and fundraising I'm gonna hand it over to Bell okay so um, what I wanted to do is go over on what we might be expecting for maintenance costs um, the uh, information that we have been uh, working to get has been by talking to other skate parks and facilities managers at um, three or four skate parks in Vermont. And basically they confirm that although we won't need much maintenance in the beginning in the first three to five years, we'll have to do annual uh, maintenance uh, with um, a, a sealant on the surface and we'll have to um, look for small areas that are opening up um, in the cement. I have a few pictures there, for examples, that I took last weekend in Portland, Maine, just to show you guys what we're talking about. Um, and um, sometimes there's tagging um, and graffiti, and you have to spend money to, you know, remove that and they have a product that's basically uh, it's like a vapor barrier product that you would put on the surface so that it does the paint doesn't uh, get absorbed into that permeable surface um, the other expenses relate to um, just routine park maintenance with garbage removal um, landscaping mowing weed whacking and that kind of stuff which shouldn't be that different from what what we've had out there the last 12 years, um, except better. Um, the good news, as Mike said, is our short-term fundraising um, is going really well. Um, we have $42,000 in our forward bank account. They're our fiscal agent for fundraising. And we have $55,000 in pledges from donors who wish to re remain anonymous at this point. Um, and so we hope that that grows. Um, the, uh, what we hope to do is, is, what we plan to do is kick off a capital campaign in, in January and hope to raise around $60,000 um, know, by June 1st. And the way we hope to do that, and we really haven't even started doing this yet, is to reach out to our community, our local businesses, uh, companies in our, in our town, in Stowe, and in our region to see if they'd like to contribute um, to the park. And um, so we also will be working, hopefully, with Tara, who's there, who has some expertise um, in social media as well and uh, online fundraising campaigns. And we hope to do, part of the strategy is to match, you know, with some of the uh, pledge donation funds is to do some matching campaign fundraising through that. Um, the long-term fundraising is really about how to sustain the park and generate the revenue to offset the expenses. And most of that, based on the folks that we've talked to in Manchester, Vermont, and in Burlington, and in Ludlow, and Brattleboro is, you know, to run mini camps through the recreation program um, with the kids, and you know, usually they charge anywhere from three to five hundred dollars per kid per week, so that can generate some revenue. Did that make sense, Roger? Uh, five hundred dollars per kid per week. That's a lot. 
But it's I'm helpful. not saying we want to do that. We may make the camps lower, but I'm just saying the numbers that were given to me. Okay. I put up there. Um, let's see. Um, the other opportunity for for um, revenues would be um, holding events there, skate jams, and hopefully an annual fundraising event as well sometime in the fall. Slide seven is about um, the, uh, oh, that's on my, yeah, is about safety and security. Um, over the last couple of years, we've started up a dialogue with um, Lieutenant David White, who um, a couple of years ago, I guess he's moved into a different position, but he was the um, captain in Middlesex there. And we talked to him a lot about um, any concerns that he might have down at, at the um, River Road Park location. And then more recently, I talked to um, Trooper Ryan Riegler about his thoughts in, at Hope Davy and his experience there and other recommendations that m they might have. Everybody agrees that we should probably have a high resolution security camera um, so that we can have data um, if and when we need it. Um, we all, they also recommend that we check in frequently, that we have a good line of communication, and that you know we do that they do routine pass-throughs into Hope Davy uh, regularly as well. Um, the there is some some lighting in the parking lot there, so I'm not sure how much optimized lighting that we need to to do there, but. In, in down at River Road, that was a, an issue because there was no good lighting down there. Um, optimize your signage. Make sure that you let people know there's a security camera in, in operation. Um, uh, Ryan recommended having um, your, your rules and policies when the park is open, that it will close at dusk, um, and emergency contact number. Um, and then they point, we, we also are aware and talked with them about the intergenerational use of this cohort of people who enjoy skateboarding. Is it's, You have younger people, families, older folks, all using this space together, which is nice and, and often a deterrent. Um, so that's um, great. And usually there's a very high level of respect among the people that are there skating and sharing that space together. So that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, safety issues, as you probably know, for the last 12 year, years, we really have not had any major injuries at that skate park. Um, there's been no 911 ambulance rescues, um, in, in, in my knowledge, to my knowledge. So that's a good history um, to, to um, look to. Um, not that things won't happen, because uh, they do, um, but um, be aware that our, our, our past has been good. Um, the, uh, the other thing that you think about when you design a skate park, and Jake might speak to this, is that you design a perimeter, a safe perimeter area where skaters can remove themselves from the area where they're skating. They can you know, rest, they can watch, they don't have to, it's important to create space for that. And we hope to have some seating so that people can watch and be safe and out of, out of the fray. Um, Jake is designing um, a, a park that has good flow. And uh, generally speaking, uh, what we'll see is a decrease in noise from the ramps. We had, on those wooden ramps, we had metal uh, ramps that were louder than concrete is very smooth, very quiet, generally speaking. So that's also a positive for the changes that we're hoping to make. And then on the signage, uh, we'll make it clear, although it's difficult to in enforce, as everybody knows. But th there's never any tolerance for alcohol, smoking, vaping anywhere on park property. So. Um, Otherwise, Mike, is there anything else on that you want to add? No, that's it. So that's the, kind of jumping into to a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. for, 
nice logo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really cool logo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So my first big one is we just a few months ago finished the Hope Davies study, and that took a year, and that had you relocate. So why the big pivot? Just a few months later to stay here. I think yeah. There's two things really. The, the one is we took down the park <coughs> because it was unsafe. So we kind of we don't have a park in in uh, Waterbury right now. And I think what I was seeing, and I think everyone will share the same, you know, the, the, the coordination and the, the amount of, um, I guess, the amount of work that needs to go into getting the river road, uh, you know, all those pieces together and coordinated, it seemed like that was several years out. And we were really eager to replace the park. You know, we have some money now, we have some momentum, and we have some space. Um, so it just seemed like the path of least resistance uh, again, we're not we're not taking off that other park uh, off the table. We're, we're going to see how this park does. Uh, I think that's the. If anyone else has any input, that's the idea. Okay. Yeah, I think I think too that with the funding, it was a little concerning because in the last you know ten years we've seen it flood frequently, and um, the area that we were given is is not really it's still in the flood zone, so there'd be a lot of expense to the engineering for that as well. It's a bit daunting. Mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, Mike. That kind of dovetails to Tom's question to mine is that, so you're pretty much dismissing the River Road site, because to me, I'm concerned long-term with if there's two parks, what's the you know, the cost becomes exponentially more. And, you know, I have no problem if, if you guys think oh, baby is the way to go, because of, uh, flooding is maybe, could, could be an issue. But long term, I think us as a select board would have that concern. You know, what, what your long term goal is? Are you looking at developing multiple sites or, you know, and how sustainable would that be for the town to run? Can't answer that right now. I know. <laughs> no, but I think what you're you open to with it, it's you, you seem to, I guess, we're not taking it off the table. We're yeah, you know, I, that's what I got yeah. the sense. But that's what I think as a select board, we're kind of concerned with, you know, they're just all sorts of services that come before us, and you know how much can taxpayers afford? So that that but becomes and you know that could be to your detriment by taking this that river road site you know down for a few years can be afforded for right. a few years but i i understand kid, kids like to have fun and I think that's an important thing um i would love to go back to the site plan and the budget um i guess just one thing i did pull out the plan and actually think what you have it looks like aligned with at least this draft of the park study that we adopted i'm looking at which had 14 additional gravel parking spaces um, I guess the budget as outlined that we saw that you're raising the additional 60000 for what site work and other work is that covering? Is that just to construct the park itself, seeing that the basketball is a different place? Or would you be asking that to be a municipal expense along with the parking? I guess I'm curious in adopting a proposal like this, what would be a commitment from you all in the coalition and what would be a town ask? Right. Um, to that end, I would say the town RFP, I don't commit town staff to anything off the end of the meeting, yeah. so we no. just want to make sure Tom and town staff was comfortable, because there are, as you acknowledged, yeah, requirements good. around <laughs> what a town RFP is and if we're doing that versus if Yeah, know, I mean, one, one, of, one of the ideas for us swapping the parks or the, you know, the facilities, the basketball closer to the um, fire station is that you wouldn't need to do any work there. You could use the existing asphalt surface <coughs> for basketball. We thought that would be, you know, good. And and then the we're not 100 percent sure. There's forty thousand dollars to build out into that grass, and we we are presuming that cost or assuming that cost. You know, again, we're going to look for the community to maybe donate some of the materials, maybe some of the excavation. You know, we don't know exactly what's in that. We haven't really done a lot of you know, detailed elevation work out there where we're going to know, you know, learn a little bit more about how much um, we have to 
uh, put beneath this part. Because usually it's about six inches of gravel um, below you know, your, your, your concrete slab and then your features are above that. Um, so, but just to answer your question, I think in just, in, in just, our hope is that we wouldn't be asking the town for money to do this expansion. Our, our fundraising uh, contemplates that. Katerina. Um, I would just like to add to that that the Hope Davy master plan does talk about the parking, so the parking is not part of the coalition's plan either. Right. Um, and then the ADA path that was referenced is also part of the Hope Davy master plan, not the coalition's mm -hmm. proposal. And how about the basketball? Basketball is not part of the coalition's, the, right. as I understand okay. it. But so you would leave the space open and then be up to the town to. Yeah, and there's some partition work in between the park and the and the basketball court, so we need to think about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Which to make could sure be a great no spot for viewing. Viewing, nice. Yeah, seating. there's a couple of options Stadium there. Stadium seating. So there's some. Nice. There are some instances where it's going to be a little. There's a gray area. Who would provide funding to? But just out of curiosity, why do you feel it's important to double the size of the skate park? I think, it, I mean, uh, a dog park up in Burlington is how many? 25,000. 25,000 square feet, and that's a proper, legitimate skate park. Uh -huh. 4,000 square feet is very small. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the 2,000 square foot park as is right now is incredibly small. Yeah. And that, any idea like how many skaters that accommodates and how much the proposed one would accommodate at a mm -hmm. time? The one right now, due to the features, accommodates maybe five at a time, four mm -hmm. at a time. So mm -hmm. I'd say double that, doubling the size. At any one time, that many skaters can be skating, and then twice as many can be spectating. So you could have 20 skaters there easily, I would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll tell you, as someone who skateboarded on the ramps that previously existed, it accommodates two. <laughs> well, you're a big guy. Poor <laughs> children. Gary. Um, so I have a, a, being the immediate neighbor, a fire station, um, and I, I had a good conversation yesterday. Oh, God. There's <laughs> a microphone up here. Yep. I'm sit by yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, We had a good conversation. Yeah. Fire Chief Gary Dillon. Um, First, I, I want to go back just from what I was, what was just talked about, is that down to the uh, ice rink, it floods. We're talking about a concrete skate park. So <coughs> closing it off shouldn't be that difficult. I mean, everybody else functions. We clean up the, the softball fields. People clean up their houses. But beyond that, I think if you build in Waterbury Center, even though you're saying that this other park is still in the back of your minds, it becomes further back because you already have a place. And that's based on experience with everything that ever happens. When, when somebody says we're going to do this and this is only temporary, it's never or rarely temporary. So that's one of my concerns. But the biggest concern is what we have been experiencing at the fire station for the last 12 years. And that is, and it's by a small percentage certainly give you that, but it's the disrespect of some of the people that are there. It's parking in our parking spaces, even though there is signs. And when we've had, and I try and keep only the officers to talk to people, because I don't want everybody doing it. Um, they've gotten pushback. You can't park here, this is for the fire department. Well, you don't have a call right now, so I'm not moving my car. So this is ongoing. and. When you just talked about having these big events, we're going to have even more parking there. And it's just an ongoing pain uh, for me because I get all the emails, I get the phone calls, and I can't always go running up there. So you get emails and phone calls from my members, <coughs> your guys, yeah. right? Saying Team. I talked to people, they were parking in our parking spaces, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to move. Mm -hmm. Was it people are parking there that are using the Correct. skate park? Right. And even a month and a half ago when I was up there, I pulled in to go do something and there were two cars parked there 
and they were at the skate park, and they were adults. What kind of a collaborative agreement do you have with the horseshoe gang that comes down? They don't park there. Where do they park? They park there out around to the left-hand side. On the grass? Yeah. The grass was designed to have parking. So you don't let anybody park there? No. No, if we have a call, where are we supposed to park? So how many parking spots do you have there? 15 or 15. Yeah. yeah. So would you like to see the parking expand to accommodate some of the other activities that I, use that space? Well, if, if when they have soccer, because uh, my granddaughter plays soccer, so we go up there, we went up there a number of times, the entire green grass area beyond the paved portion, out and around to the left, is all designed for on-site parking. So is that what you're saying? You'd like to see more on-site parking? I would like to see nobody parking in the parking lot. So, but, but people need to use the space, so where do you want them to park? On the grass, where everybody else parks. So you would advocate for expanding parking as well? No, no, no I'm not. No, no. no. The, he just the doesn't grass, want to The grassy yeah. Oh, no, I, I get that. Zone. But they still have to be welcome to park somewhere else. So sure. Do we put up signage? Or there is signs. I think down we tar help or communicate we? a little better and uh, advise the skaters. Say something, a sign saying skateboarders, please park past here. Do you think that would be helpful? No. No. <laughs> we, and I say that based on years of experience. And if what works for soccer is they actually have a person standing there saying you can't park there. Mm -hmm. Now I get that you folks can't be standing there all the time. I totally understand that. Mm. And it's not everybody. I've gone up there a number of times and there's cars parked out on the grass. But What do you think the solution is then? I, I think the, the solution is that you folks explain to people that potentially the skate park is in jeopardy of not being able to be used. Or to some degree like that. Why should the fire department have to scurry for parking spaces when we have a call? Because people don't want to, they're going to go skateboard, they're going to use energy, but they don't want to walk 15 feet. So I'm hearing a lot of negativity towards That's the people that use treated. the skate park. That's how we have been treated with the fire department. We've had graffiti, we've had trash, we've had to shut off the power outside of the station because people continued to use the power there. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of people tr talk to us with disrespect. Mm -hmm. So that is how we have been treated. And, and I'm not opposed to people skateboarding. I think they might feel disrespected as well, potentially. Because we asked them not to park in where it says fire department parking only. I mean, it might be time. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously there's some fences that need to be mended here. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think they probably can be. Um, yeah. so, uh, but I, I, I do want to say that every time I have approached somebody, I've been very professional and very polite and have been treated less than that. Hmm. So it's, it's not like we're going up and we're starting an argument. Hmm. And I've been very clear with my officers, do not start out in a negative way. Just walk up and ask them if that's their vehicle and could you please move it. And they still get pushback. Um, yeah, I would just say that I, I think we, we certainly will need to take this into consideration uh, moving forward with this uh, and maybe there is a signage issue, communi obviously communication issue. Okay. I was just going to say there are two parking lots at Hope DB um, that do not include the fire department's parking lot with ample parking for the amount of people who are going to be skateboarding at, at this potential skate park. It shouldn't be an issue as Chief Dillon pointed out to walk the 20 feet to the skate park in the future when it is built. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's not a big ask of skateboarders or anybody using the park not to park in the fire park or parking lot. There are, there are two parking yeah, lots. Yeah, I, I think <coughs> if you put a sign up, skateboarders park here, you'd be surprised. I think I'm surprised that you got, you know, that, that's some bad apples there. I'm not doubting you. you, you and I'm not saying it's the majority of the people. It's a small yeah. percentage, I'm sure. I think some mm -hmm. signage. They're usually yeah. cooperative people, I think. But the, and there is a sign that says additional parking yeah. with an arrow going out onto the grass. Um, and soccer uses it all the time, softball. Or kids, baseball or softball, they use it. Well, 
I just wonder about Im improved signage adjacent to the park as we move it out. I certainly would think that that would help. Yeah. It's not going to hurt. Yeah. A little more specific as opposed to just saying firefighters only help direct skateboarders that way, you know? Well, it's, like, it's not just skateboard homes. It's everybody that What's uses that the park. It's the skateboarders want to park next to the skateboard park. Mm -hmm. People that are playing softball or baseball or soccer, there's a lot more vehicles and they know they're going out onto the grass here or they use the two parking spaces. But people that we have the biggest problem with are the people going to skateboard and they're adults. They're not the kids. So is there is there a possibility of really creating instead of being kind of muddy grass because mm -hmm. it's kind of a low point there what if we created a better uh, defined parking area that has skate park signage <coughs> because if and when this surface expands you know it's parallel to to this, to where they would be parking so they would be right next to the skate park so theoretically they wouldn't have to take firemen uh, firefighter spots right right so, yeah. so maybe we can do better signage and just define that space better that would be helpful um, and, yeah. and I'm I'm just basing it on the last 12 years of our experience mm. um, mm -hmm. and again a month and a half ago my experience uh, well I'm glad you're not talking about security because I think um, you know if you if you feel that there's interpersonal stuff that can improve and we can identify ways that we can improve it mm -hmm. that's good um and i thought maybe you would have security concerns about lighting or other my concern certainly lighting will help your park users that doesn't impact me uh, it may impact the neighbors with lighting although it's i don't know that we need to put more lighting in there but i was wondering if you thought we did well lighting and parking i'm sure will be also addressed by the drb yeah in that process okay yeah. um and, and if they're further away we likely will have less garbage left at our back step maybe i'm hoping um but we've had to pick garbage up because especially when it's raining or it's really sunny out during the summer and kids will want to sit underneath the entranceway to our station because it's in the shade, oh. and then they leave their garbage there. So we end up picking up garbage. Oh, there's so, no, there's no garbage bin there. Or of course anything? there is. Oh, and they still leave it. Of, of yeah, course, that's do. annoying. Of course it is. <laughs> so, but it's not. It, this can insolvable. All be, <laughs> no, it's not insolvable except it hasn't been solved in 12 years. I. This is the first I've heard of it. You've this never is, spoken to me about it. I've never knew who was in charge of the skate Oh, we now heard. we do. They, they yeah. certainly do. We're making, we're making progress. Yeah, we're making you making progress. Yeah. problems behind the Main Street fire station? From time to time. We have equally number of parking problems in front of the fire station. I would just be really interested to see if these problems continue next year if we weren't to put up a skate park and it was to be completely empty, if trash is still being left and people are still parking in those spaces. You know, I just don't know if it can all be blamed on skateboarders. That, that's a good segue. Mm -hmm. Can we perhaps go to the slide that had the timing for the RFP? Right here. It's a good question, but it's the, the people that we have engaged that were at the skate park and they parked the cars there. So it's not like we had to go looking for anybody. Right. So on this slide, since so it's empty, it's empty now. Uh, it's been empty now for a couple weeks, right? Maybe a month. Mm -hmm. So this has the town, the town's letter had an RFP in January, but as of today, you're 60,000 short. Um, so how do we issue an RFP in January if we're not fully funded? That's why we're here to talk about these things. I don't know. I don't. It's a good question, I guess. I didn't know you have to have fully funded projects. I guess people wouldn't bid on a project that they didn't have funding, or I mean, they it? would. The, the vendors wouldn't necessarily know, but it, it's hard to ask a vendor to, to do work in preparing a bid if we might not go forward. I think just. Right. Yeah. Particularly if it's coming out 
from the town, then the town's on the hook. Yeah, no, no, I get that angle out of that concern for sure. So I mean, I'm sure there are local vendors we can call and say, give us, you know, give us a rough cut. Mm -hmm. And they well, that's you have to do that. That's yeah, I think there are. Some, I think that is reasonable uh, expectation from the people we've been working with on, because most of these projects. I know Ludlow just did this. Yeah, like Tammy has. Oh, Tammy's got Okay, uh, Tammy. Uh, I would just like to interject there at a um, meeting recently that we had with Katerina and Tom. Um, we spoke about that. If we fell short um, of monies <clears throat> coming due to start construction. And Tom mentioned that the town has a, I believe it's um, a revolving grant of some sort or loan that are is given out to uh, grassroots groups and he suggested that that was might be a possibility for us to <coughs> talk with the selectmen about as well. So the, the our utility district has a loan fund but I'm not aware of it being used for a project like this. One thing for the, the select board to think about and something other towns have, have done many times is if you've got a local organization that wants to get a project off the ground and they're they're reasonably close and you feel like they can fill the fundraising gap over time that you can you can fill that gap and essentially give them a loan um, the challenge that oftentimes arises is the organization then completes the project they don't have a whole lot of incentive to fundraise so you've got to have a lot of trust and you've got to have a lot of faith in that organization's ability to over some you know whatever period of time to pay it back mm -hmm. I don't, I don't offhand know about the, um, I should know, but the, the loan fund through EFUD, I don't know offhand um, if the criteria, if, if community organizations like this qualify. Um, we, wrote, we rewrote the loan terms about a year ago, but it's all been businesses that have applied and some nonprofits, but they've all been EFUD customers. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alyssa, sorry. Um, well, I was going to go to you and Rec Committee and also cut her in to ask for stuff. Is there a planned VOREC application for the town as of now for this grant cycle? I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. We, um, at our last Rec <coughs> Committee meeting, we did discuss that, that um, I will be writing a grant that focuses mostly on accessibility in the town or ADA accessibility. So dollars. there is a current planned application for this grant cycle, because I guess, like, just to name, in the past there have been a town work application and a skate park, so I didn't know if there's an opportunity to partner, or it strikes me this is something that's maybe poised for implementation, so clearly I haven't been part of those conversations, but seeing as fundraising is a barrier and just wondering if there's ways to, or maybe, again, ADA trails there would be a different component of the work, as you highlighted, that could potentially be funded. Um, so it sounds like there is a planned application from the town that might support aspects of this work but would not fund skate park work directly, is that correct? Yes. Could it, because, I don't know if you explored it or not, but, but you know, they encourage if it's one area to include multiple projects in that area, so municipality can do multiple things included in the track. So, so maybe Right, so this bill rec grant period has five different buckets, one of them mm -hmm. being flood mitigation. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to focus areas of the town that were flooded this sure. July, um, which are mostly Dac Row. Um, and Dac Row also has some ADA accessibility issues. So um, my, my attempt is trying to thread that there's flood, flood mitigation that's needed at Dac Row in addition to ADA and use ADA through our other parks, mm -hmm. um, tacking on other recreation ideas sort of makes it a little bit mm -hmm. um, bigger of a grant that's maybe not as connected. But the coalition and us have talked a lot, and if I am able to, to throw in some other things, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, but we're just trying to clean, keep more or less of a clean application, if you will. And then your fiscal agent is Forward. And are that would that be an avenue because a nonprofit can apply with just you know a letter of support of a co-applicant or a letter of support or what it might be from a municipality. Um, 
So that might be an avenue as well. And it's for, for a vote grant mm -hmm. through that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if it's a full application, I guess I will say, like, as someone candidly, I was on the VOREC review committee for work. I couldn't review anything related to Waterbury for obvious reasons. But just to say, like, I think um, as a select board member, selfishly, I would want to prioritize a really strong application from the town, like Katarina was talking about. That being said, there is an implementation bucket with a $50,000 minimum for projects that could be implemented in the spring. So I guess, like, per Danny's point, nonprofit organizations are eligible. Um, as a grant reviewer, getting multiple applications from the same community that aren't connected can be a little bizarre, but I think if there was a strong effort for a really compelling application, as a select board member, I'm also certainly not going to sit here and say, like, the town has, you know, the monopoly on applications, but I guess I just, in full candor, my thought would be, like, I really hear Katarina's rationale around flood, and that also lets us date that to July for expenses, which would be really great for the town. Um, but also, there is a separate bucket that maybe is eligible to this project. And I would just say the piece I would ask, because that does require a town sign up at the time, would be like, is it a you know fall application? And um, again, if both sides are like willing to do that, I'm certainly willing to help support that in ways I can. But wouldn't want to see a application you know that wasn't quite all there. And how competitive is that uh, implementation? Well, it was there? redesigned this year. I mean, kind of like they took a year off because what we found, part of the reason there is so many buckets, and like I'm not speaking for the pre vendor, but like there was a huge spectrum of they've now created a whole <coughs> development category acknowledging mm -hmm. that um, you need planning and comprehensive park study and so some of the work we actually as a town have invested in <laughs> in doing to say that we like now have, you know, like, an ADA map? There's more money in this round. There's a million more dollars than there was last round. And there's different specific tracks. So it could decrease competition in the tracks, but it, there's just no way to know how many applications are going to go in each one. So it's a, it's a heavy lift of an application, but it's a minimum of 50000 and could be well worth, especially, I don't know if you said somebody does have that, like Butters and Grace, I don't know what's grant writing, but it could be well worth looking into to see if it's. And that's spring 2024 funds? For, yeah, for beginning work in the spring. And the implementation track is where you would want to go because you've got, you know, you're planning. Um, but it is due December 15th, so. But yeah. Tom, what do you think if, 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 you know, what's your take on the original question if, if we did have only 75% of the money in our coffer, would you, you know, is that a non-starter? It's not something I can do on my own. And that authority would be something that select board would have to consider if we're moving into the budget season, so it's not bad timing. The real issue for me is, is you know, not just the last year, but the last two years. What's your fundraising history? Can you realistically fill that gap? And I've, I've done this in other projects in other places, but it's it's always been tied to something um, that the municipality could own and had a, had a stake in. If the fundraising wasn't there, you know, you built a building, you're building you know, mm -hmm. you get a mortgage in essence. In this case. Um, it's a little different. I, I guess I'm also curious or rational as to why it would need to be a town RFP. I certainly understand you need town sign up, but I think of like going to the development review board, you as the skate park coalition can apply as the applicant and the town can sign off as the property owner. That is a model. And right. so I guess also just thinking about like staff time and resources, which is actually more of my like, is there a yeah. reason <coughs> the, no, 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 the coalition or forward for couldn't issue an RFP? Right. I'm just following most of the models that I've seen Got are it. usually when the town gets involved and make sure, again, like the bonding and all those details are sound um, versus just someone grassroots may not know all the ins and outs of what you need for a proper contract. So but we could explore just doing it outside of the town. But the expectation is the town can hold it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you're going to have to insure everything else. So. Yeah, Mike? With the coalition post-construction be contributing in any way to the maintenance and upkeep of the park and and or possible having um, you know additional side liability coverage for for you know the skaters the liability coverage is mm -hmm. we are I, I I know the town has but sometimes you know supplemental coverage doesn't hurt I know that from the knowing enough insurance agents. I, I think our coverage is pretty comprehensive. I'm not I'm really concerned about that issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I wouldn't 
I, if I were you, I wouldn't want to be holding insurance because that, that opens you to liability. You know, mm -hmm. some lawyer's going to say, well, they get an insurance policy, let's right. go after that. Deep so, but yeah. excluding the insurance in terms of the long term maintenance responsibility of the park, you know, did you have any plans for? Contributing to town coffers. Well, we, we I mean, we've always kept up as best we could right. the other skate park. Right. So that we have a whole lot I mean, of volunteers. The plan that you presented was the fundraising long term is to offset the maintenance costs, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll raise enough revenue to cover the expenses. Yeah, and person power, we can always come up with somebody. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll acknowledge that we're going way over time here, uh, and I apologize for that. I should have allowed for more time, more discussion on this. Um, to my mind, there are two concerns here. One is sort of the conceptual design of this uh, and the expansion from what was uh, approved uh, in the overall Hope Davy plan, which to me doesn't seem terribly different, and I wanted to get Katarina's uh, take on it from a recreation standpoint. Are you okay with the conceptual design as it's been presented? Yes, and as is the rec committee, I, I would just say that Hope Davy never, the Hope Davy ma na master plan never mentioned how big the skate park would be. Um, it just mentioned that there would be skate a skate park and there would be basketball, um, which is why the recreation department pulled the community for their thoughts on basketball too, um, mm -hmm. on if you know they both should exist there um, by getting more feedback. And, and the community said, we want basketball there, which is why um, the plan as presented today keeps basketball there and expands. Mm -hmm. And are you planning to have money in your budget for the trends transferring the basketball court into where the park used to be, where the skate park used to be? Yes. <laughs> yes, I have to figure it out, but yes, that is the plan. I realize we're not yep. there yet. I'm just like, you know, seeing how far the planning has gone. Yep. And uh, I don't know if you've considered uh, the parking question, uh, whether grass is sufficient or whether more needs to be done there. Yeah, the parking is in the master plan, mm -hmm. and certainly if it, uh, ongoing consideration. I think it depends on how much money is in the budget. And there is money to redo the basketball court? That's what um, uh, That's what I was asking. asking. Yeah. asking we'll we'll there, be voting on this. There is <laughs> <there's laughs> not money to redo the basketball court. There is money to use the existing asphalt and possibly resurface it so that it's a better surface to get basketball on. Okay, and then you have to yep. plant cool. the uh, hoops that either end there. Yep. It's really expensive. Hmm? Shockingly expensive. Mm. Yeah, that's well yeah. Okay, well, I guess we'll be hearing more about it. Um, and then the other, the second issue is really how this whole funding thing is going to come together. I do have concerns about, you know, essentially writing a, a, a promissory note for sixty thousand uh, dollars. I'm not sure that your fundraiser. I mean, I, I appreciate everything you've done and wish you the best, but I'm not sure that covering sixty thousand dollars in a couple of months is really a, a, a good bet. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, I think, if you, you asked for uh, some sort of conceptual approval, or can we get, um, I'm wondering if we could approve the concept and then hold off on the discussion of how the whole thing's going to get financed to, to, a, to Yeah, a I mean, I think one outcome would be it's, it's a 2025 project. In the event, you guys, you know, it's just a non-starter again for one reason or another. If we can't really get town's approval until we have full funding. Then that would, that's one option is just to delay the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Or go private RFP. I yeah. heard that too. So that's something we would, so there's a couple options we could do here. Seems like the quickest and best option would be to really get the town's support and approval moving into this BOREC grant coming up. Yeah. yeah. Right? If we yeah. could do that, minimum 50 grand, there's our budget. We've already raised $100,000, which we're willing to put in right. to a town asset that's going to be used. Mm -hmm. It already has shown massive demand, and we've raised $100,000. We would just love a little backing for this BOREC grant to get 50 grand. And we're there. Mm -hmm. You know? That's, that's our best option right now. We love the support. 
it's an Olympic sport right now. You know, like it's not just punks anymore. Like, <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Was it when you were there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. But it's, yeah, there's just, there's massive demand for this. Mm -hmm. And as long as we can address all of the concerns like parking and all that, which I think we can, yeah. um, the whole community, people come from all around to use this little dilapidated skate park. Imagine if we could come up with an amazing state-of-the-art little skate park in our town. Mm -hmm. So yeah. many towns. And get them to park in the right area. Yep. <laughs> so many towns have really nice skate parks, and it's just it's crazy that neither Waterbury nor Stowe does. I think we have. Yeah. We should talk to Stowe, too. Uh, we'd we'd rather have it in Waterbury, though, you know? Waterbury's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Um, so maybe we could entertain a motion uh, to for conceptual approval. Approval. I, that? I move to approve the concept as shown for the skate park at Hope Baby Park. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I feel a little weird about it, but it's not, not that I oppose the skate park or disagree with the concept. And I guess I would say yes. That's why I mentioned Vorek. I think that's what funded Ludlow's. Mm -hmm. um, you can look online. I think that's how they got yeah. the money. And I guess I would say I'm willing to do that. I want to see the application just because, respectfully, I helped work on previous Vorek's when it was a time of not great alignment. And so I would just want to make sure it was a really strong and compelling application. I'm willing to meet with someone offline before December 4th to help do that. But I would say my they would be, I would want it to be a, a compelling application I thought might be worthy of getting funding before I was diluting water race chances in the VORAC pool to support yeah. it. But I think it is um, a compelling option that's worth looking into. I think that's where we struggled in the last application is we just didn't have proper backing from the town. And you know better than me that it takes proper town. Yeah, and I appreciate you being here. So I guess that's my, again, like I'm not disagreeing conceptually and I just want to feel like one more broad. Yeah. Um, on the same page. So yeah, for my thought would be vote rec, come back next week or something, we look at an application, we meet with yeah. Katarina, we make sure Amazing. it's, you know, offline. I May I ask, yeah. ask a quick question? Quick question. Uh, it's sure. a little sure. difficult sure. on Zoom to hear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alyssa, so, are, so are you suggesting that the coalition write their, their own VORA grant, grant? Or that, that we jointly, jointly do come, come in, in on, on this, this one, one that Katarina is working, working on. on. What Katarina shared, and she can chime in, is that she was working on one specifically on flood recovery. So that was a different bucket, and there wasn't really a lot of overlap. Um, so what we were talking about here is potentially there's an implementation category, and nonprofits are eligible. So it also would be a question for if Forward was willing to do that. But I think to some of the points Jake is raising, you have matching funds and you have an implementable project on the process of being permitted in approximately the timeline, which is a very different place from previous years. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if there was a concerted effort there, that was mm -hmm. something the town could align with. There are um, like office hours, and I, I will forget to email you. So you can look online and find it, or please feel free to email my personal email and remind me to send it. It's coming up maybe next Tuesday um, for open forum to ask questions. And I have asked this specific question. Um, and the, the answer that I've gotten is that like flood, flood related applications are treated very, very differently. So I think it could be a good chance, which is why I personally was like pushing it. Um, so if you don't find those office hours for that Zoom, feel free to email me and, and I'll send you the link for that um, to answer a lot of questions about the applications. And um, they're really, really helpful. Great. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you. Any further discussion? You Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? No, Are you opposed? I oppose, <laughs> and I'm not opposed for in conception, but I'm opposed to the fact that either the Vorak or the, I, I know we're talking about this conception, that the committee is going to raise money. So that's where, you know, by that January date, something had, you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if the town is going to come up with that whole bucket of money. Well, so, the concept could apply to 2025 also. Right, it was just the, yeah. as drawn. Yeah, we're, we're talking about the, the layout. Okay, we're, 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 we're I have no problem, problem with that. I agree. Right. As a fundraising so member of the so, Stowe Street so, Alley so, Committee. So, is it, yeah. <laughs> so with that clarification, Mike, you... I could change my vote. Would you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, would. 
All right. But you can see why I have some apprehension. Nice. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I look forward to working with you. Yeah. Sounds good. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Does anybody yep. know who that couple was sitting in the back of the no. street? Tam Tamitha and uh, John. Two last names. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Something passing. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll get it. I can find that. Maybe J A S E. Yeah. I'll, I'll get it. The daughter's name is Harper, and her last name yeah. is. Is embarrassing. <laughs> is this called H A A S E? I can find Tamitha. it. Tamatha. Tamatha. Okay. Just, just as a, an aside to that conversation, what Gary Dillon brought up, we have heard that complaint. I agree. A lot. And something, you know, it's. I know it's just a few bad apples, and maybe it's something we need in ordinance to have, you know, for parking where firefighters need to be parked. And maybe with a restorative justice program. Well, as a note, we may have heard that a whole bunch, but I'm not aware of action that we've taken, to be super frank. No, we haven't. So I think it's a good location for a camera. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, yeah, and we in just not in the we hear it a lot, and we can <laughs> put it in the vote. Right. This is I'm serious. Like I will I will email that group, and this is one where I will help write it. What candidly drove me nuts in the past? I know this is a public meeting, but was like. The town was doing one, they were doing one, it was totally separate. And I feel like now that at a place that there's a separate implementation budget and we could build this stuff in and say, maybe yeah. we need to build a kiosk so they're not on the fire permit right. back. So it it says it's permitting in process. I don't know if they've yeah. done the DRB, but if they're on the December 6th agenda, they've at least warned the neighbors. So they have a much more, in my mind, compelling application. application to say they're yeah. at least moving forward and maybe it can be some resources to help at least worth throwing money at a problem could help. Mm -hmm. You know, as someone who I would say, like, I would not park on the grass. I don't care if they say it's intuitive. I, would, I wouldn't park in fire spot either, right. but I wouldn't park in the grass. So right. I think the, there can be some problems. The problem solving. is with signage is it's always enforceable. We, yeah. yeah. We've never had anybody, it's all important. you know, there's a sign here. It says firefighter parking only. Yeah. You don't park there. I mean, Waterbury never, Waterbury Center never had a police department. There was, you know, we didn't have staff to go out and oh, yeah. write tickets or anything else. So it's, it's as Danny said, it's just this constant push-pull. It's, mm. it's not an easy solution. It's mm. a, it's an irritating problem. <coughs> it's, it's. There was some irritation points. Too. Yeah. 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 Gary made that very but clear. But I do think there are steps to take. We're not going to solve the problem entirely, but there are steps that haven't been taken that we can take and try. Right. And also, if they fully fund and go forward, that's like, I feel like that's a thorn that we can work on. You know, the big issue is going to be funding and moving forward with our kids. Right, because that's still going to be a process. So. Yeah. And Tom, you had other questions that probably didn't get asked, but uh, we'll take those up as we go That's forward. Okay. Uh, next thing on the agenda is the third quarter financial update. Finally, mm -hmm. I can be I can be pretty quick here. <laughs> Just want to hit some of the highlights. Um, no, no big issues on the revenue side. Um, the second line down is the other governmental revenue. Big chunk of that actually came in at the beginning of November. So not in this update, but at the end of the year. We um, we get about $106,000 from ANR, no, which wrong. is... Which no, is, it's just the bigger one. The <coughs> same one, Tom printed us a big one. Which is reimbursement for uh, people in current use. Mm. Um, that nets us less, the state makes us whole. So that came in on budget. We know that number in advance. The pilot number we don't know in advance. We budgeted 360, we got 400, so that'll be in the final year end. But that that, that all looks fine. Um, huge change in miscellaneous revenue compared to a prior year, but that's really where the ARPA funds get transferred from the ARPA fund in here. So when do you think we'll know about pilot? <coughs> we got it. Oh, we did. Okay. Yeah, we got 400. We budgeted 360, so okay. we're we're looking good there. And next year should be next year. Several other towns are collecting their local option tax, so their mm. pilot fund should grow. Mm, yeah, more money. Uh, so that's found money, that's great. Um, in general fund expenses, um, nothing huge to look at until the fourth line down, which is the flood. Um, so there's 102 that are, are about 125. Um, so some of it's a little hard to. to um, net out. 
the response included Public Works, you know, hitting their stockpile for gravel and, and crushed stone. Um, we didn't make a purchase necessarily that day. We had to refill our stockpile. Some of it's in labor costs, and so really the, the expenses is, we didn't have overtime necessarily. We had opportunity lost. So we didn't do some gravel road work we didn't do this year. Um, but the Sign Up Genius has also helped us a lot because through Sign Up Genius, mm -hmm. there's a lot of documented labor hours, mm -hmm. and all those hours are reimbursable at $28.14 an hour. And at least anecdotally, the FEMA rep has said that that's pretty good proof. Um, so there's other, a lot of other hours not logged on Sign Up Genius, but there's 30 grand mm -hmm. that we did not spend that this community should benefit from. So in some respects, bring in the disasters. <laughs> <laughs> no. Is there any likelihood we go to the 90%? Does this apply to this, or did I am I thinking of different FEMA thresholds? Um, I don't know. There's several different project categories yeah. within okay. the details. Okay. Um, but overall, it's not going to necessarily be a hindrance to our to our budget. One of the and is the ongoing work <coughs> of crew uh, covered by the so, FEMA volunteer? We're still, we're still paying for Tom Drake's hours, which are pretty limited. Mm -hmm. um, the 2024 budget will have some proposal for crew and to continue some expenses there. Mm -hmm. uh, but are, you, are they tracking the volunteer hours so they can <coughs> charge against that? Or? That's different. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't believe that's, that's reimbursable through FEMA. Okay. We haven't had that many. Volunteer hours for crew, yeah. But yeah. you and yours have been putting in a Oh, we, yeah, the board's been putting in a lot of time. Yeah, well, that's, that's sort of what I was oh, I, well, getting towards. Is that is any of that? I don't think it's really much. It's so, still okay. And going down. I had a work day on yesterday. <coughs> One mobile home. That's what I thought. Which would be? About. Probably not. I think Tom's right that uh, the ongoing stuff <coughs> that. Uh, crew is doing a small kind of Brazilian building. It's not a, a direct response to the flood. So I don't, I don't think it's really important. Okay. Thanks. Um, and just while we're on the flood, um, I believe in the next meeting you'll have your first formal request for a buyout. Mm -hmm. And potentially that may be it. There could be three or four others in the works. Um, but we're slowly getting there. But what's, what's interesting to think about. Um, property is bought out, essentially you get a clean lot when it's done. You, you, can, um, you can't build on it. It's got um, to be essentially green space. You can do nothing with it to become a whatever. Um, you can mow it. You can have a park and ride, but you can't pave it or gravel it. Um, but what's interesting is we could have a situation where we have a couple of lots on Main Street and a couple of abutting lots behind it in Union. Um, so we could have a small, a small assemblage well can you put like benches and little trees there or are you not yeah. allowed to do that yeah. you can do that you yeah, can put, you can put a playground course. but you can't pave it you can't gravel it so not, not so much as long as we don't put gravel below the <laughs> playground we'll be fine <laughs> you know the challenge is going to be um whatever we do it's another item to maintain and we're still going to do that now That's it's not so much the grand list impact because if it's three or four houses they're not high value homes right now how much should we wind up paying St. Albans for the back machine? Nothing. Not, so Nothing. But not the do we offer them? Something? But they'll be part of the claim. Yeah. Okay. So if we get FEMA money for St. Albans and South Burlington. So then we'll, what we'll we get in the can, claim, we'll give them money. We can send them money. Okay. Is there, I thought we had to pay their time or something <coughs> like that. We did not. That was all, was all volunteers. And, um, the more I learned, it wasn't just us. Um, a lot of towns who were not impacted just swapping back and forth. They came to work one day morning, and, and the town manager just said to the public works crew, "Just go where you're needed. Mm -hmm. We'll see you in a week or two. That's so there was a lot of that. That's cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. I treated the mayor to <coughs> and his family to do <laughs> <with> so. <laughs> And they went home with a fair amount of booze in their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Come, I'm sorry. Before we move on, will we get some more briefing on buyout? Yeah. Processes in yeah, I wanted to ask that. Yeah, next meeting we can have a session on that. Thank you. Um, going down page one through departmental budgets, no, no, no real red flags. Um, 
recreation has spent more than last year and their revenues are above last year and that's kind of the continued trajectory we see there. I mean, Katarina didn't mention it when she was here, but we did hire a program coordinator. Oh, okay. Who will start in a week or two. Okay. Hey. <coughs> she, um, she's local. Um, I think she's living with family right now, so looking for something a little more permanent, but she's, she's here. I'm sure. It's the best of luck. Um, highway fund, no real issues on the revenue side. We drew up the tax transfers. At, I'll true that up at year end. Um, the, um, despite the flood and some of those costs being bedded in highway, their salary and fringe is actually a little bit down from last year, but we're down a person. Um, fuel is down, mm -hmm. diesel's come down, that's, that's been good. Um, salt. Um, we just spent a couple more grand, which was the first invoice I've seen since, you know, March or April. Um, we'll be over budget on salt, not dramatically, I don't think, unless December's really bad. Um, chlorine, sandstone, and gravel combined uh, were under budget, will be under budget by year, and then part of that is the flood, and that we were diverted from doing gravel road work. Um, so there's the opportunity cost I mentioned. Um, Vehicle and equipment repairs where we, we budgeted a lot more in prior years. We've had thirty or forty thousand dollars with that mechanic. We raised that budget. Um, probably raise it a little bit again next year, but no no huge red flags. We um, also not in here is we had an old vehicle that we budgeted to sell that we finally sold, so that'll be in the fourth quarter, but it was nice to, to get that done. Um, Talk about the library a little bit, and this will also pertain to, to public works. Um, so we'll, we'll true up the property taxes at, at year end, um, but substantially all their revenue is from property taxes. There's not much else. Um, another big piece is our investment fund. We budget some investment gains and essentially um, skim some of the earnings off the top, so we'll get that in the, in the fourth quarter. Um, library expenses look pretty good. Um, overall, um, but something that I'll just hint at, and it'll be a little bit of a theme, uh, potentially the 2024 budget is, if you look carefully at library wages and some of their duties compared to some of the front desk town staff, there's a little bit of an equi uh, of an equity there. So that's something I think we may need to address over time. Um, so we'll talk about that more when we get to 2024. Um, but in general, the library, I think, does a good job of managing, so there's no, no concerns there. Um, cemeteries are a big concern. We, and that's the bottom of the second page, we budgeted um, some expenses greater than revenues this year in the cemetery, and they had some, uh, they had some donations from a prior year that were going to spend, so we took that money in a prior year knowing that in a future year you're going you're gonna to spend it. And they had some additional work they wanted to do, and so the cemetery commissioners agreed that if they are over budget this year, the difference will come from their trust fund. And so I gave them an estimate at their last meeting of how much they're going to need to withdraw from that fund, and they, they agreed. Um, they did some long-term maintenance work they wanted to get done. The challenge with cemeteries is that we... Um, now we paid two thousand bucks a week to Mohope Cemetery, and that's not really sustainable, I don't think. Um, so, cemetery is going to be a topic of conversation in future years. Um, part of it is just going to be how much we're going to maintain the cemeteries, and our standards might have to change a little bit. You know, Bill Woodruff and I are looking for someone to do it cheaper, but we're also saying, you know. Maybe weekly is not gonna not gonna do it. This year we mowed weekly and trimmed every other week, and maybe we need to switch to mowing every ten days. Um, but two thousand bucks a pop is pretty tough. Um, I've taken a pretty hard look at the electric, uh, the um, the all electric uh, smart mowers, where you essentially you let them go. Right? You draw a line on a map, and they just like the little ones for your like house the they have robot, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they dock themselves uh -huh. and you can and they have commercial ones that, that are rated for large areas and the wayside uses one and the challenge is okay you're going to spend 60 grand on a mower and if it lasts two years i hope you've paid for itself um 
the issue is we can fix the engine, but I have concerns over things like the warranties for the computer. And Bob Butler may not be a whole lot of help there. So I, I haven't convinced myself that the technology is there. But that's probably our future, is we're going to, at some point in the next, call it five years, I'm going to ask you for a six-figure investment in lawnmowers. And we will deploy those at various places, and they'll do the job. And is that a long-term investment from our local option tax uh, revenue? Right? That's, 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 that's a great example. That's a great example. Um, but I think that's the future. Um, probably going to schedule some demos for next year. Just mm -hmm. try to convince myself better. It feels pretty tough to consider a, a six-figure investment in a, in a lawn mower for a cemetery mm -hmm. versus well, a roadside mower, which you might expect a lot of money. But for $2,000 a week, it may well be worth it. Um, people in the cemeteries don't have like these perpetual care agreements. <coughs> I know a lot of, especially in bigger cities, <coughs> you know, you'll see that kind of thing. You know, we might need to look at the rates right. about what we charge, but no, there's no, no agreements like that no to my knowledge. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so the money that is in the cemetery trust fund, if you will, cemetery is all in one fund. On 55, I think it is. Uh, so you don't really necessarily have to take money out of the investment portfolio because <coughs> there's interest and uh, gains and losses in investment that are already part of the revenue there. But to your point, Mike, um, there were two cemetery associations in Waterbury. There was the Waterbury Cemetery Association, which was Hope, and there was the Waterbury Center Association, which was Maple Street and the Route 101. Back, um, it was right after Irene, um, the folks at Hope, I mean at uh, Waterbury Center, uh, they couldn't, they didn't have enough volunteers. So anybody who bought a lot at, at either of the cemeteries paid for the lot, that money went to the town, and they paid a perpetual care that went to the association. The Watery Center Association had about $100,000 and they had it basically in money markets and CDs and people like Ed Brown and Bob Graves and, and um, uh, David Graves and other folks who you know that uh, mm -hmm. lived up there, they all had lots and they took care of the cemetery. Over time, most of the members of the Watery Center Cemetery Association lived in the cemetery, as opposed to being able to mow the cemetery. They were all <coughs> And they came to us and said, we can't do this anymore. And there's a provision in state law, the cemetery association basically folds its tent. They turned over their $100,000 to the town. Hope Cemetery, about six years later, did the same thing. So the money that is in the investment portfolio came from those perpetual That's care right. accounts, okay. and now it's town money. So you've got all that money now. Okay. And, you know, um, Tom is right. I mean, and, and John Woodruff's pretty good at kind of keeping up with the Joneses, but, uh, you know, they've raised the, the rates for buying lots. The challenge now is that there's more and more people that aren't interested in being in a cemetery anymore. So you don't, you know, I mean, even when I came here 35 years ago, almost everybody was being buried in the cemetery, whether they were cremated or not, whether full burials or cremations. But now, you know, there's green burials, there's all, you know, people just get cremated and go have their, you know, kids spread their ashes in the woods or at the beach or whatever. So there's less and less people looking to buy mm -hmm. lots, so it's a challenge. Yeah, they're trying Are you to still this one when John Woodruff retires from this, we're going to have to pay someone in all likelihood a fair amount of money to, to do all the work he does. Right. And, and we had a great deal. I mean, the Watery Center Association forever uh, maintained that. And it was probably around 2014 or so that the highway department, in addition to mowing the rec fields and whatever little highway areas, they started mowing Watery Center cemeteries. But uh, we had a guy until last year who was mowing Hope Cemetery 
for you know thirteen thousand five hundred dollars a year. We paid him every month, you know, fourteen hundred dollars or whatever it was because he wanted it spread out over time. Um, and unfortunately, you know, he came to us a year ago and said, I, I, "I'm done. I can't do it anymore." Well, so, robot mowers. Sounds like the way to go. Sounds like it might be our future. Yeah. Are we still selling perpetual care? Uh, Options. I don't think it's, no, no we've taken the money from people already. It, it, it's, well, it's just that, that, it's that just was true before, too. Uh, it's just the lot rent now. I mean, uh, it's all kind of combined into buying the, the lot rent. I mean, uh -huh. Because when you used to buy a, a lot for $250, yeah. $100 went to the town, or $150 and $100 went to the association for the perpetual care. I see. But, you know, Perpetual care for a hundred dollars or whatever it was, I mean, forever. That's that's a great deal too. So I don't know what a lot sells for now. I, I honestly have not recorded very many cemetery lot deeds. It's a handful in my time here of a year. Um, they're they're a, a, you know one of them was quite expensive, but usually a two two lot like for some reason it's like fourteen hundred dollars. Like yeah. 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 And I don't really know how big that is, to be perfectly honest with you, but it, it'll list it like double lot, and yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's there's not there's not a lot of them. Bill's Bill's right. It's I've done a handful of deeds. Yeah. I have to remember how, you know. Yeah. Um, municipal building operating fund. I uh, was pretty worried about that beginning of the year because right at the start of the year we had huge invoices with our heating and cooling system. Um, most of the early part of this year, my office was 55 or 60, and Rachel's was 85. And I think in the middle we were OK. Um, and, and you know, Bill Woodruff came close to blowing up the system a few times and, and just saying, Tom, I'm going to get you a wood stove and a window AC, and you can, you can make that work. Uh, 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 uh. But it's been working fine since. Don't say um, that out loud. So we, yeah. uh, we had like a fifteen twenty thousand dollar invoice at the beginning of the year, but so far we've been we've been pretty good. Um, we're looking for new uh, custodial services for this building. We haven't been super happy. I'm not sure they've shown up as often as they they used to, um, but we'll try to figure that out. But overall, that budget looks okay. There's a big debt service payment that we just made a week ago. That will show at the year end. Um, and on the capital side, um, the, the capital budgets, which which will collapse a little bit, you agreed to collapse them in 2023. We just have time to really do it mm -hmm. in 2024. But the interesting thing on the capital side, for example, is in 2022 you budgeted 130 grand for a new truck. We paid that, which was only 111 this year. This year we budgeted a. Uh, 140 for a new truck. Um, we've got the chassis, which we paid about half of that for. We're waiting for the body. We've been waiting for the body for six months, and there's no end in sight. So the chassis, to make room, we moved to long-term storage off of Armory Street. Um, so we borrowed. So we we paid that. We paid half the bill. We've got in the budget also uh, to issue debt for the full amount. So at year end, if we don't have the full truck, I'll probably issue debt for half and then do the other half when we get it just to make the capital fund mechanics work long term. But sometimes your capital funds are really strong and sometimes you're really weak and sometimes you're just dependent on when you budget to make the purchase versus when you actually make the purchase. Um, the ARPA funds, um, I'll move in by year end. The, uh, the first bridge here down on Armory Ave. Uh, will be done this year, the Guptill Road Bridge. Uh, they don't have time to get to, but that'll, that'll stay in the capital funds. We'll still do that bridge as planned. We had a gravel road project done, uh, planned for this year that um, they just ran out of time and didn't get to. So they were hoping to do a, a big swath of, they really wanted to focus on the bottom of Sweet Road. Um, so they're hoping to do that next year. And, and that was, again, a big part of that was just the loss of time with the flood um, mm -hmm. that the crew had. Um, but no big surprises. The one, the one change we I think I talked about earlier, but we um, we had in the budget a pretty substantial amount of cash to buy a new mini excavator. Um, we have decided to delay that 
indefinitely, I think. Um, part of that was the gravel road project, and in past years we'd leased a mini X for some time in the summer. Um, we did that this year, and I looked at the hours, and I just wasn't convinced we need to build one because you pay a base fee for the mini X and you pay by the hour, and we leased it for a few months and. I would have expected we would have used it 40 hours a week in addition to our own excavator, and we simply didn't. And so um, part of that is our road crew is very determined to do specific roles where, you know, one guy grades and one guy runs the X and one guy runs this machine, which drives me a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> You'll feel your pain. But we just didn't spend enough on the, on the rental for to justify buying the new machine, so mm -hmm. did the, we held did off. The, did the flood kind of <coughs> push them away from doing some of that stuff? The flood did. Um, you know, they, they had a week of emergency repairs, which, which messed them up. And then they spent all this time hauling because they went through a big, char big part of our stockpile. And now, of course, they're hauling from South Barry. Which is a major hassle. So the, the big decision we'll have in future years. Um, for 2024, we've already decided that Public Works does not need a new truck. We might ask permission at some point in the year to order one in 2024, pending voter approval in 2025. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to budget for a truck in 2024. We've already gotten that far, okay. which will help a lot. Um, but our big decision point is going to be. Do we spend money on contractors to haul gravel and sand, or do we buy ten, a bigger tandem axle truck in the future? We've always had one tandem axle truck. Um, the current thinking is we, we might stay there, but we might want two or three to replace things in the future. So the tandems are um, 225 right now versus the, the, the single axle, the one ton we're buying at 140, 150. Um, but how six much more gravel will it hold? The, the tandems can hold typically 15 or 16 yards, and the, the, the smaller vehicles are, depending on the one, which one we have, but um, I think one of our vehicles can hold half that, but most are three to five. Um, so 16 is a lot. To our knowledge, there's no, um, I've never in my life seen a tandem axle truck towing a trailer. But we're looking into whatever options we can figure out there too, if there is something like that. Um, but that's an awful lot of weight. Yeah. So but we'll try to figure that out over time. I think part of the challenge that we always had about whether you buy the tandem or get contractors, and contractors are more expensive than they used to be, I'm sure. So the, the metrics change a little bit, but if you do it yourself and you if you commit to doing it yourself, it's better to have a tandem. But then you have a guy that spends ten hours a day just driving and he doesn't do any work. You know, there's nothing getting done. So you know, hiring a contractor might be more efficient in terms of getting some actual stuff done. It's always a balance there. So we'll try to figure that out. That's going to be a topic of conversation, I think, for a while. But no, no red flags in, in 2023. Um, it says flood in a way is is a blessing because we won't spend our capital budget necessarily because we couldn't, but we'll get reimbursement above and beyond our flood expenses. Um, why are we just going back to finding the zoning? Why are we so much under just? I know we knew Steve was leaving, and we knew the whole, you know whole Davy expenses were there. And I know you said some of the base expenses were less. What what was significant? Less. So we were vacant for a while, but then we also had, off the top of my head, twenty five thousand dollars budgeted for the bylaws rewrite. So we're spending that now. Okay. So that money will be probably entirely out the door by the end of this year. Now that's grant funded. Uh, but it doesn't show in our expenses yet. It doesn't show on the road. Okay, that's the right question. But I mean, Mike's position was vacant until he started, right? Which was vacant quite a while. Maybe yeah. September? Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Neil doing double duty there. Any other questions from the board?
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And then on the budget schedule. On the budget schedule, what I've I've tried to I looked at a couple past years and tried to do some reasonable planning at least to the I, you know don't hold me to the times but at least the dates. Um, my thought was for the 12-18 meeting. And so the Friday before that, I will send to you all a complete budget packet, um, tax rate, tax levy, all the all the goods. Um, so when we go to the departments, we've got a pretty good understanding of where we're at. And if we're at a two percent tax increase, and you're all pretty happy with that, maybe the review changes a little bit versus if you're at five percent and and you want to know how much we need to cut. Um, so I just thought to get something pen on paper, I know typically um, you meet every week in January, um, which I think is probably going to be necessary, but um, I think this basically gets us there. Um, some, some agencies um, historically will come in, but I'm not always sure they need to. Uh, for example, uh, the Solid Waste Management District and the Senior Center have both told me there won't be an increase in their funding request. And if there's no increase, I'm not sure they need to come here. Um, a letter might be just fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can have them here if you want. Um, but if there's no increase, um, can I just say, John has not raised fees in like a long time. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I don't have on this schedule is I'm. Um, beginning right after Thanksgiving to talk to the state police about that contract. Yeah. So that expires June 30th, so even if they demand a very large increase, it's only half the year. Uh, but, but And then every year after that. Now, for the last three years, that contract has been almost perfectly flat. So we know in those three years, the cost of policing has gone up comparable to the rate of inflation. So that. That being said, they've got every right to ask for a pretty substantial increase. I'm hoping they're pretty community-minded and they like this model, and and um, you know I think they benefit from it too. So I think they they won't ask for something quite that high. But I'm not expecting them to ask for a zero. Um, <coughs> just a couple things, like I mentioned, I think the cemetery will be a, a topic of conversation greater than it was last year. Um, we did a preview of REC a couple months ago, we talked about the program coordinator, so I think we can probably spend a little less time on that one. Um, ambulance service will be another topic of conversation. Um, Recreation could be dependent upon what happens with this whole thing. Yeah. Um, to give you just a brief preview of ambulance, um, this year they're paid at $26 per person per capita rate that we've agreed on. There's two credits in that bill, one because we own their building and two because we pay for the dispatch service fee. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the ambulance service were to break even this year, their necessary per capita fee would be $48. So 26 is not sustainable. Um, we're not gonna have a budget proposal that go brings you to 48 in one year, which would be a you know, 125 grand, something like that. Um, but they're not on a sustainable path. They've got they've got funding to build their new building, but it's operations that hurt them. Um, so they're doing better, and they've gotten some some grants, some some grants, and some of the work, the, the, the COVID vaccine, the COVID clinics, and the food clinics, for example, are, are sort of found money and help them out a lot. And I think they've got a pretty good strategic plan to try to bring up revenue, but in the end, part of that is going to have to involve the town in a pretty meaningful way. So I just want to want to preview that. And that's all I have for the schedule. Um, we can, if there's any particular topics um, anyone wants to focus on, just let me know, and we can we can pivot. Thanks for our Christmas gift in advance. I know you well, said that when we interviewed you or it, soon after you were it hired. It might not be a gift yet. It's not a tax rate yet. <laughs> I'm taking it as a gift Often. regardless. The sentiment is a gift. Other questions?
and just by collapse, more collapse than this? Yeah, um, so what I'm thinking for the capital... Which was capital funds from last year. For what I'm thinking for the capital funds is um, one fund for highway and highway equipment. Um, potentially, um, potentially a separate one for fire, a separate one, separate one for recreation. Um, but we have, I think, five now. So going from five to two or three, we've got to got finalize it. all that. Got it. Thank you. Off, obviously, the first for the holiday, and then meet for weeks. <coughs> yeah, are we planning on uh, the first is a Monday, mm -hmm. uh, so often we just move to the following day, uh, Tuesday. But here it is, the eighth. Um, that's the uh, first day. Is that a better option for us? Tuesdays are generally tough for me. The one day. All right. At least until April, and then my wife's not running. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what do you do? The only note is. Well, um, he's got it listed here as uh, the following Monday, the uh, eighth, as opposed to the first. Right. So, mm -hmm. but there's which, there's four weeks. There, there's four. There's four more Mondays. I'll throw a wrench though. Yeah. Monday the fifteenth is MLK Junior Day. I don't know if that's a holiday that. Office is closed, or I don't remember. I don't know. I know what expected it. Never was. Unless we added. We changed. We added. We added two. We did the handbook, but I don't know if it was I one of them. I think we <laughs> added MLK yeah, and took away President's Day in February. Isn't it not? Isn't isn't there a holiday in February? Yeah, yeah. that's. I think we took that one away. Yeah. yeah. Okay. For wait, what is it? February? Yeah, no, that's. Great. That's what stuff. they've been doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we, yeah, yeah we had a Valentine's We have, yeah. we in fact had the third Monday in January off. Okay. Although I'm perfectly open to have a meeting that, that night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Can we? I should have. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Eat holidays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about this week. I'm so stressed out about the short week. It's so much easier to come to work. <laughs> I don't think hey, I, is this a good second for me to just share a couple of things that I thought I might be asked? Mm -hmm. um, there's been 18 ballots for your. Um, Thank you. Okay. For your. Um, for the fellow to the charter change. I'm getting tired, Roger. <laughs> what are we voting That's on? It's, it's the charter change. Charter. Charter. <laughs> Thir charter. Thirteen of them have been returned, um, and today I did receive Patrick Farrell's resignation from the Development Review Board. I do think that that seat will be um, popular. Yeah. Really. Are you so planning on opening it? Well, it opened oh. today, really, when he when, when he, he retired. When he, yeah, yeah uh -huh. re he retired. Um, so I'm telling you that now because whatever night we decide to do that, I think you probably will get a fair number of people interested. When, when did what are we voting yeah. on? It's, it's the charter. 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 <laughs> charter. Town charter. Thirteen of them have been returned, um, and today I did receive Patrick Farrell's resignation from the Development Review Board. I do think that that seat will be um, popular. Yeah. Are you so planning on opening it? Well, it opened today, really, when he when he, he retired. When he yeah. yes, he retired. He retired. Um, so I'm telling you that now because whatever night we decide to do that, I think you probably will get a fair number of people interested. When, when did Packard's term expire? 2025. You do have two alternates on that board, right? So I don't know whether, you, you know, I'm not asking for discussion tonight. I was just giving you a heads up that it happened. Um, so how we want to go from here is- That uh, one's always kind of very active. Yeah, I think um, I think Mike was telling me today that, um, is it Joe Wartzbacher 
has been very active because Patrick has been unable to attend. So, yeah. but Joe is now on the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee right. and indicated to me, at least verbally, that he was not going to seek reappointment on the it's development review for 2024. So, yeah, we usually do those after town meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, would the normal uh, turn of events be that uh, the we would be offered to the alter alternate? You know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe in, in Bill's yeah, history here, or Tom has some history here. Of course, look at that. The alternates have been appointed. So the, the vacancy goes to them first. Patrick's term expire. Twenty twenty five. You do have two alternates on that board. Right. So I don't know whether you, you know, I'm not asking for discussion tonight. I was just giving you a mm -hmm. heads up that it happened. Um, so how we want to go from here is and that one has always had very active alternates mm -hmm. on the, on that committee. Yeah. I think um, I think Mike was telling me today that um, is it Joe Wartzbacher mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. been very active because Patrick has been unable to attend. So. Yeah. But Joe is now on the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee right. and indicated to me, at least verbally, that he was not going to seek reappointment <coughs> on and the development review for 2024. So. And are those all for April? What it would be? Yeah, we, we usually do those after town meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, would the normal uh, turn of events be that uh, the you would be offered to the alter, alternate? You know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe in, in Bill's yeah, history I think here, that's, or Tom that's has been some history here. Course of events that the alternates have been appointed. So the the vacancy goes to them first. I, I don't know. I didn't. I got this. I don't know if it's ever been a, it's a total for procedure, but I think that's when, when I was on the board and we had alternates, usually the alternate would pull would move up. up. Would move up. I think that's, you know, I discussed that with the um, Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. Might they not consider alternates versus having such a large board and having problems with quorums? Right. So. You know, you, you can then still have a lot of worker worker bees, but have some old alternates who could do stuff. And participate too. Yes, I, I feel like this should be a larger conversation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Perfect timing. Next item mm -hmm. agenda. Next <laughs> agenda. So, but uh, to resolve, I'm okay. I am available, and at the same time. I just think about the message that it sends, like, it certainly moves the 4th of July, right? But having it on that location your day just doesn't display, like, a, yep. a, an investment um, in the holiday. And I don't want that to be what we portray to the community. So I think it would behoove us to either move it on a different day that week or the first week of the month. Not that I want to, but let's just put it's the right thing to let's do. Let's just put, put something out there to consider, and you can tell me it's hairbrained. Worked for a board once, and how we do the budget? We took a Saturday. And we spent ten hours on a Saturday, and we went through the entire budget. <laughs> Bill's not exiting on and that. Then had, and then we had regular meetings. See you, Bill. Um, and it was. Thank you. Too. Too. Yeah. And it was an experiment they tried one year that they loved. They loved. Well, you know, we were lunch, and you know, had some pizza. Yeah, but then they, they preferred that versus four or five eight nights in a month. Mm -hmm. Hear me out. We do the Saturday and only one meeting. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think what I give you on the 18th will dictate, to some extent, how okay. much time you want. Like I said, if you're at two percent, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a different review process yeah. than seven percent. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, so. Take it till till the 18th, mm -hmm. um, where I will not be there. By the way, um, I will be in a different country. Oh, okay. So do we want to do a Saturday? Is that where I'm just saying I'm I work for you, so if you wanted to change the schedule. I also need to give work a proper I won't be there that day. 
Um, yeah, I mean, do Saturdays even work for you? Or? I work on Saturdays, but I can, right. of course, tell them that I need time off. And mm -hmm. it's November, so I should, that's proper notification. Okay. Um, but at this point, do we feel like we can just leave it until the 18th uh, and then see how much work is actually going to be needed? Uh, yeah, and if I can get your son before the 18th, I will. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, next uh, meeting. I don't have a lot on there as of yet. Brian Boyd was planning to come tonight. It's a good thing, actually, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't because we were going to have talk. But uh, he, has he expressed that he would be available on the mm -hmm. fourth? Yeah, I think he'll be able to be here that on the fourth. Okay. And how about uh, our note taker? Um, she is she going to be available? Because she has a, uh, an important uh, duty the following day. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you should change the meeting, mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't wish to be here till this time, though, if I come. I would, ask. I would like it to be a brief meeting if I'm coming to it. Okay. Well, so far, it's ending at 7.30. <laughs> we'll have, um, You asked for buyout <laughs> training. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll have a buyout request. Okay. Yes. Um, in all likelihood. It's just a matter of signing and notarizing the paperwork, so we should be there. Well, you'll need me for that. Right? I, you we mean that notarizing? Uh, our dear friends, the skate park. I think they're doing it in advance. But they need to submit something to us. We'll figure it out. Oh, I thought you meant yeah. you needed it notarized. I we have some information beforehand on the buyout. Yeah. I'd like to add a discussion on uh, short-term rentals. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Pick a time, it doesn't matter to me. I just vote after our guests. Yeah, if I think we're you want to ask the uh, guests first. What time does your car escape park in back? How long do you matter. think the buyout uh, request needs to be scheduled for? Um, for now, it's just one individual property. Mm -hmm. Doesn't take very long. Fifteen months. Yeah, yeah we can and come. We can nail down work. times, Roger. Yeah, I just was trying to get a sure. sense of. Uh, I mean, the, I don't think it's super controversial at this point. It's the, the the people's who I've talked with buyouts about have, if they all took buyouts, our grand list impact is six or seven hundred thousand dollars. It's not huge. You get mm -hmm. one new home built in Waterbury Center, and you're even from that perspective. Um, there is chatter at the state house about getting a bill that would reimburse towns yeah. for their mm -hmm. lost yeah. grand list somehow. Yeah. Which would be nice. I'd be um, and there's no there's no local share to the buyout. The state is covering the 25% the we normally pay. Nice. Okay. Which which is nice because it's tough to lose your grand list even if it's small and pay 25% of the buyout cost. Mm -hmm. um, but, I believe but there could be in total um, I've had conversations with four or five property owners about buyouts, and then there's one other one who, I don't know if there's a select word role here, but he's going to seek to raise his home. A bunch of people are working on raising utilities, but one person wants to raise the entire home. Since this is um, more next meeting, can I recommend we continue on since we still have a big chunk on our agenda for tonight? Sure. Okay. Why are the, um, just a quick question, why are the cameras and loitering <coughs> ordinances uh, crossed out? I was wondering the same thing. Um, there you was a. Address those tonight with yeah. the restorative justice piece. Gotcha. They need I to say come. we told Karen to. <laughs> is the yeah, short yeah. answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was being a seer and Susan. <laughs> We can unstrike through them. Hey. Unstrike them? I don't leave, leave want them on. I I don't um I don't imagine cameras are still on the table outside of like a security camera at the skate park based on previous discussions. Yeah. Same thing with loitering. I think 
noise can stay. It's been brought up a lot and we haven't gotten back to it necessarily, but I mean, that was my take, but I could be. Also, pretty unresolved on ordinances after right. this yeah. presentation. Not in a bad way, yeah. but oh, in that like, only for the new in one. like the dog bite, etc. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I mean, yeah. I. I don't know that we're going to take on a loitering ordinance in this town. That sounds. Or in the next two months. <laughs> right. I, guess, yeah. I guess that would be my like right. what time horizon is our part right. of What is our rate appraisal schedule for? The that was my seven. question around budget. Yeah. I'll have a memo on that next week, next meeting, um, about that and some related funding. Um, Wait, is that a budget? Or is that an agenda item? Yeah. So what is it? Um, it'll be re reappraisal and um, ARPA. Okay. Don't forget that part where I wanted to leave early. Yep. I understand. <laughs> So we can have, we you could have a tap out time. Like yeah, a, and, I'm, and, it, no, I'm and I may do that. that and that's fine. That's a fine alternative. It will likely be ordered to reappraise next summer. There's a process by which we can challenge that. Um, but in the end, we'll probably just start the reappraisal shortly thereafter. Uh, rather than contract it out, we think there's a team of, of local municipal assessors who can collectively get it done for us. Um, you know, it's a multi-year process. I think we've got enough money in our reserve to pay for it, which is always helpful. Um, but yeah, it should start next year. Probably wait towards, well, we'll have to make the commitments in the plan next year. It might not physic, might not really start boots on the ground until 2025. Anything else about the next meeting? I move that premature public disclosure of mm -hmm. pending real estate transaction places the town at a disadvantage. So executive session. <laughs> okay. okay, moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions?